counties. On his partner, the Senator Samson Gerard Gay said there is need for governors to receive more location in order to achieve devolution and give residents the development they deserve. Nimeona mambo ya budget. Naona ma counties wanataka 450 billion. Mimi nataka nikuulize speaker kwa sababu ulikuwa senator. Nataka nikuulize mtusaidie na hawa bunge akiongozwa na ndugu yetu hapa tuhakikishe ma counties zinapeana zinapata pesa ya kutosha. Lazima tuhakikishe ya kwamba pesa ya kutosha inafika mashinani. Azimu leader Raila Odinga's bid for the Africa Union Commission chairperson continues to attract succession politics within his ODM party, with the regional alliances emerging and seeking to take control of the party. Deputy party leaders Wukli Fobaranya and Ali Hasanjo have each come out seeking to take
is the Situation Room, the only way to start it's your eight day. Eight minutes after seven, how are you doing? Welcome to the second hour of Kenya's biggest conversation. The Situation Room is live on Spice FM on KTN Home. We are now also live on YouTube. We had a challenge earlier in the morning. It's been sorted. Uh, is it on? Yeah, it, it is, is so eh? Yeah. Okay. Everybody. Karibu sana, everybody who are now joining us on uh, YouTube and also on Facebook live stream. Thank you very much for joining us. Ecobank is the Pan-African bank in 35 African markets and four outside of Africa. Those four are in? They're in the UK, mm -hmm. in France, mm -hmm. China, mm -hmm. and the UAE. Okay. The UAE is a country. Okay. City. Mm -hmm. All right. So... 35 different markets across Africa. Let's focus on that for just a little bit, shall we? Uh, uh. And so what does that mean, really? Mm. And actually, in these other countries as well. Mm. What that means is that you're plugged into one platform in the country where you're domiciled. And if you should travel or you relocate, that doesn't mean that you need to um, shut down everything in terms of your banking and do something else. Mm. It just means that you get on the plane and you go where you're going. Mm. Or if you're going by boat or mm. if you're walking mm. or whatever it is that you're doing. When you arrive at your destination, your banking details remain intact. Mm -hmm. And all you have to do is pick up with your mobile app and continue as though you never left. Mm -hmm. And that's the comfort that's offered to you by Ecobanks. One platform It's not a group of banks. It's a banking group. And they've realized that you can do business in a better way for a better Africa. Very, very, very important. Also important for you to think of your plan. And of course, everybody has a plan. It's just some people have a plan that sounds you know, very well organized and formal. Other houses have a plan that's just in their head. They haven't put it down anywhere. Yeah. But if you ask them today, what's your plan? My plan is to live at a cost by the end of this year. Mm. Or what are the, what, what else? So how do you get there? Well, you know, I'm planning, I'm planning to mm. move out of Nairobi, relocate from Nairobi, live by the coast. So what happens to your job? So I'm working on that. Those are plans, and plans are important. And ICEA Lion says, well, you've got a plan. Come, let's talk. Let's help you actualize that plan. Whatever plan you have, how do you bring it to life? Come, talk to ICEA Lion. It will involve, of course, some part of financial planning. And that's where they come in. That's their strongest point. They will help you with that, right? Kenya is planning to continue borrowing to pay the next Eurobond. And Kenya is planning to repay all its debts. Plus, Kenya is also planning to continue developing and bringing in job opportunities into the country and making money. And Kenya is planning to be able to uh, afford did, did a you good life. Also, mention we're still planning to continue borrowing. Uh, we are planning to continue borrowing. Yes, okay. And we are planning to pay. Mm. We are not planning to default. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> that no. Is not that's enough. not in the plan. That's not in the plan. Mm. Our plan is to make sure that we repay all our debt. Now, whether the plan comes to life or not. A whole different matter, but at least our There's plan, plan. our plan. plan is to repay. But what now that we've been having this conversation about debt, 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 or oh, odious debt, not odious debt, and all of that. So what happens after? How do we move this conversation from our current debt situation to probably future debt situations? Al Kags, the executive director of the Open Institute, is our guest this morning, and we're going to have that conversation with him. Al, good morning. Good morning. Good to see you here again. I'm so excited to be here. Do you know this is the first time I'm on radio in 10 years? Eh? Yes. Apart from the, the virtual live that we did, this is the first time I'm in studio. That was in radio as well. Uh, uh, yes, but it, <laughs> you know that didn't count for me. Okay. <laughs> Being in studio is what counts. Mm. And the last time I was on um, was on KISS 100. Mm. And that was 10 years ago. Oh, what are you discussing? I don't even remember what we were talking about yeah. in those days. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm back here, I'm really excited and I'm really happy. Mm. Um, and I was telling you this morning that you're very special because you brought me out to the rural areas mm. to come and sit here and talk about this big bad monster called debt. It's a big one, eh? It's a big one. Okay. Let's talk about a big uh, proverb from a small country. CT. Yes. This week, where are we heading? The kingdom. We're in the, we're in the southern part of Africa. Mm. Uh, the kingdom of, well, it's written, they, they used to call it Swaziland. Mm. And, and the, the, the current name is written as Swatini, but it doesn't pronounce that way. How do they pronounce it? Swatini. So the E is silent. 
I'm not sure whether the E is silent or they just uh, eh? added an S to it. When you hear me whispering, it's because I'm not very clear how to pronounce <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> I can pronounce it deliberately so that, yeah. you know. So it's written Eswatini, but it's not pronounced Eswatini. No, no. The S, you, have, you start with S, not E. Eh. Eh. Mm. Swatini. Yes. Swali. Swali. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. A man who prides himself on his ancestry is like the potato plant. The best part is underground. A man who prides in, in his ancestry is like the potato plant. Mm? The best part is underground. Underground. Mm. Alcags, what's your interpretation of this proverb? Our most solid part of our lives is our history. It's the people who brought us to where we are right now. Mm. Um, unfortunately, that makes me really worried. Why? Because it means that if this is history 20 years from now, boy, are we doing a bad job of it. Mm. Mm. We are the potato of the future. We are the potato of the future, <laughs> which means our grandkids are going to be in trouble. They'll be looking at us and wondering, oh my goodness. What did you guys do? Yeah. What were we doing? And sometimes, you see, one mm. of the things that I've been very interested in has been the history of Kenya. Mm. Um, and I've mostly been interested in the history of our people, mm. those who are not politicians. Just how did they survive in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s? Mm -hmm. And when you really think about it, these people suffered and they lived very hard lives so that today we can live a better life. And I went to Turkana recently um, to interview an old man who was about 96. And he doesn't live in Turkana town. He lives way out. Mm. And when I got to his place and I was driving a Land Rover, um, he said, you know, this is the reason why um, I fought for independence because we would never have been seen driving a Land Rover unless it was owned by someone else mm. who was white. Mm. There was no chance in hell of a person like you, as dark as you, driving a car like that freely and going from county to county without a problem. Mm. When I think about what that means for us, it, that it means that we have to be pur purveyors of prosperity for the next generation, we need to be doing a much better job. We really are not. It makes you say so. What is it that we are doing today that you think our future generations will look back and think these people must have been lunatics? Well, I think that if you just look at just this one conversation that you guys have been running for the last, I don't know how many weeks, months, mm. about this debt situation, it is in our plans to borrow more. We have borrowed two point something trillion so far, and we are not stopped. Next year, we'll have borrowed double that. Um, and when you listen to the economists, you're seeing that there's one particular thing that we are not doing well, which is that we are not tying ourselves to chapter 12 of the Constitution anymore. Mm -hmm. That one we just threw out the window and forgot about it. And so when you think about the challenges that um, all of this debt is portending for actual human beings mm. outside of Nairobi because sometimes we think of Nairobi as Kenya mm. but Nairobi is in Kenya where I live in the county that I live in there is a woman who started bearing children at 13 who is now 35 does not have an ID card um, has 10 to 12 children and earns 300 shillings a day the firstborn is 22 years old. The firstborn is 22 years old. Of course, the firstborn doesn't have an ID as well. She does not have an ID mm -hmm. and rides a Buddha Buddha, but also makes about 200 bob. Chances are really high that mm -hmm. that 22-year-old has a wife and already two or three children. Mm -hmm. Dropped out of school mm -hmm. in standard three. Mm -hmm. In 2020, when I was moving into Kilifi County, mm -hmm. I went and met with 900 women over that period. Mm. They meet in these things called um, chamas or they meet, um, they're called table banking groups. Mm -hmm. They meet every Friday or every Thursday, one of those days. And so I went to meet them and I would ask them very basic questions. How many kids do you have? How long have you been married? How far did you go to school? Out of 900 women, 680 dropped out at standard two. 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 Why did they drop out? Various reasons. First of all, they started late, so by the time they were in Senate 2, 
they were 13 years old. Many of them got pregnant. Mm -hmm. Almost all of them, there was no money to keep them in school anyway. Mm -hmm. In almost all instances, the schools that we're talking about are made of mud, don't have real desks, don't have books. Some there's no real have, reason. Some don't even have doors and windows. Right. Mm. So there's no real reason to stay in school. Mm. Um, you, you, it, school was really a daycare at the very beginning. Mm. These women that we're talking about are living a life where they're trying to feed these children and many of them have land that those families have land you'll find that they have you guys have have been seeing on some of these especially gecko stations you hear maguta maguta yeah all the land that is that you're hearing is available in malindi is being sold by these families who this is their last straw right. tourism died so it cannot fend for their children anymore um then they went back to shags and they started cutting down trees for charcoal mm -hmm. they've cleared whole woodlands and now what do they have to do with this land so they don't farm to put a borehole in a lot of that land is more than two million shillings who is going to go all the way to the um, community borehole to go and fetch water so that we can come and pour it into the ground so that we can grow something so we grow hungry this is actually real situations now when you think about the fact that we are borrowing and then it's going into general support of the budget. And then we use that money to um, refurbish state house. Or we use that money so that we can do this NADCO report. Mm -hmm. report. No, no, not just the report. Mm. We've got bills in there. Mm. Nine. Now we've created new offices, mm. right? Yep. These new offices are going to have staff. And these staff are going to need to be remunerated extremely well. All of these things are going to be happening at a time when we accept that more than 70% of Kenyans live in rural areas. And the further away you are from the center, whichever center that is, the further away you are from any government services that you can speak of, the further away you are from opportunities. Last, uh, last December, the community that I work in, because mm. I work in a, in a co-working space that we created in Malindi called Maono, Mm. And it is a community of change makers, this community based organizations, uh, thespians, actors, that sort of thing. Last year, that group went and mapped out all of Kilifi's um, health and education facilities. The biggest thing that was found is that, yes, as you would expect, many of those facilities have no doctors, many of those facilities are, have no equipment. There are facilities where the maternity, there's a maternity room mm. um, but that's where the doctor lives because wow. we built the facility and then we forgot to provide for where the doctor will live <laughs> so if a woman comes um, to give birth then he has to organize himself a little bit wow um, create space uh, in, create his space house. in his what is now his, his house room. Um, using that bed which he probably uses um, she gives birth she finishes and he tries to get her out of here as quickly as possible yeah Okay, yes, sorry. so that he can. Go is this back a home? true story? Um, like, this is a true story. I'll, I'll please, just um, sorry. I yes. usually need some kind of clarification. Please so do. That then my chagrin can now be well founded. Yes. Um. Uh, this is not an imagined situation where we're talking about. This is what would happen because we've not built the quarters for a doctor, or uh, this is real. This is a real place. Today. In 2024, January. This is a real place where the medical officer actually lives in a maternity um, ward. He needs to get that woman to leave as quickly as possible so that um, you know, you he goes home. back home. Okay, so um, allow me to ask this question. A lot of times when we, s we, we talk about uh, uh, a number of these things and looking at what priorities should be, nationhood and i often say that the face of a nation or the state of a nation is the condition of its most vulnerable or yes. its individual yes not community yes not family yes individual if yes. you have one person among millions who suffers to an extent not within their own making that's the face of the nation yes that because that one is what now taints the rest of the the image so that is the situation we look at. So oftentimes when we have the finger and we start naming things and we talk about the health system being in a mess, education is 
going to the dogs economies in the doldrums then we are not actually being sensationalist are we i can tell you this 80% of the time i listen here on this station mm. on tv or whatever i listen to people say, talking about the state of the nation and talk about the state of health i have recently learned that we don't know what we're talking about i challenge anyone to leave this beautiful county of nairobi ignoring the fact that there are slums and there are yep. what you call low income neighborhoods and yep. people are suffering informal settlements informal settlement and mm-hmm. so on mm-hmm. and take a drive 2 hours outside of nairobi in any direction or take a flight to kilifi then don't stop there don't go to malindi land at the malindi international um, airport airport mm-hmm. take a car and drive 2 hours which direction in whichever direction you choose as just make sure you will still be within kilifi county you will be in kilifi county in fact right. if you drive 4 hours you will still be in kilifi county mm. go even as far as the next county over which is um tana river or the next county over which is um, um. garisa mm. and just look at the state of human beings lives look at what people are living when they when you when we're talking about oh you know we really need to prioritize water and sanitation yeah honestly we have no idea what you're talking about we have no idea that there are children in 2024 who wake up in the morning early going to school have to pass by the woods so that they can fetch firewood and the girls can fetch water which they go with to school or they don't they go back home with it and then go to school which means they're definitely going to be late yep. and we are expecting that these children are going to be competing they're going to be competing with these ones who are here in Nairobi at Kimathi primary school even mm. at Kibera's uh, school olympic olympic really it is a dire situation that we are living here and unfortunately 70% plus of kenyans live in rural areas the point that i need you to remember if you remember nothing else i have said today is the further away you get from the nearest town yep the further away you are from any service mm. you that woman now telling you who does not have an id the reason she doesn't have an id is this is that she has to take transport and pay 200 shillings remember how much i told you she earns mm-hmm. mm-hmm. each way to go to um, town mm-hmm. to go to that place where she's going to be told umekuja na photocopy ya id ya baba yako she didn't know she was supposed to come up with this photocopy yeah. then she has to go back home and plan another trip back mm. what are the chances she does that on 300 bob a day she's going to go now here's the worst thing that you need to know city most many women die in kilifi county not because of the unavailability of the health facilities but because often times it is near impossible to get to the to the facility so i live in changoto the nearest facility is in adu i have to get on a motorbike at 9 months pregnancy to be shaken up on a road that really is not even a maram road and if it and worse if it was like when we were trying to collect that data in december when it has rained there are places where she has to get off the motorbike and cross the river, the, cross the flooded riverbed mm. um while the picky picky guy is holding it up true story honestly holding what up the picky 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 the motorbike you and have to hold it up and the woman had has so to that it, you can't river. drive it into the into the water you have to carry it so you carry it along while she makes do or somebody is helping her along get to the other side she gets onto the motorbike and they are slipping and sliding what are the chances of the miscarriage well, close to 100% yes so the better option is and just give birth at home and what happens so that you know that this is mostly not reported is that if this child dies near that river why should we bother continuing just go back we just go back yep we don't even bother to tell the chief that it's happened again yep if you meet the chiefs of those places they're so jaded because they have seen so much that and meanwhile we're talking about the fact that we are needing to borrow 2.5 so that it does general support so that it pays salaries mm. are we serious yes we are 
I was looking on, uh, you know, you, you guys have talked about a lot of stories. I was looking um, on Twitter the other day, and mm. there's a wonderful person who decided to tell us about why the Lake Turkana um, wind project failed. Mm. And I was amazed. We are talking about a KPLC that last year posted, um, no, this year posted 319 million in net profit. Yep, half year. Half year profit. Mm. While we are encountering load shedding and blackouts and all this as the order of the day, mm. that even presidential functions encounter blackouts in the middle of speeches, mm. right? Mm. Th th we, what are we doing um, having a KPLC um, giving us profits. What are those profits for? When you really ask yourself these questions. Mm. And so when our grandchildren are going to be looking up at us in the future and seeing that we have a country that has that is lagging so far behind where energy is concerned, whereas there are some wind turbines um, up in Lake Turkana whose energy we cannot ferry because we just didn't complete um, uh, an electricity line. Really, what are we talking about? Mm. It was a whole complete uh, disaster. All down, yes. Yeah, because we, we all saw it. Electric kind of wind power project started. Everybody knew it. I was driving on Mombasa Road every morning for many months, and you'd see those turbines being transported from Mombasa through Mombasa Road. Yes. They're put somewhere at uh, some yard on Eastern Bypass. Then they are transported from here to Loyangalani. Yes over 500 kilometers away, everybody knows, many of them went up, they were then installed, they switched on, they tested, and then they tell Kenya Power, now we are ready to give you power. Kenya Power is like, we are ready to receive power, but the guy who's supposed to do the connection for us is Katrako. Katrako Mkwapi, has a evacuation line <laughs> that is that's that's always going to be a story that you'll ask yourself very many questions. So what Let's our children break, are going to read is that we paid. We had to pay that, so many months. We paid 14, 14 billion shillings for power that was being generated. For that power that was consumed. being, but we are paying eight point five billion every year for power that we are not consuming until the, that evacuation line has been finished. It's half past seven. Kenya's biggest conversation is hosting Al Kags. He is the executive director of the Open Institute. We're talking about the next steps. We have had a conversation about our national debt for a long time. Now he says, let's look at the next conversation that then we should be having regarding this debt. Keep it here. We'll be back shortly. Let's take this break. Take a look at the weather and traffic. This is the Situation Room. The only way to start your day. If you go out of this country and come back the same person, then you have a problem. Buy land, one million. Put it there for five years. What's the purpose? It will have increased in value. No, that's the thing. That's darkness. You know, that's an air eclipse. You don't do that. I hope you don't believe that a hustler is a poor person. Or that all oh, hustlers are poor. I've seen that conversation. Tell us, who is that? So who is a hustler? Hustler is a person who is uh, making his a living through hard work. Corruption in Kenya is a political accusation. The people who are actually corrupt are not pointed fingers at. Kenya is not free. Mm. Kenya is under siege. Have you seen that lodge on Nanyerere Road? Very high fence, you can't even Windows see inside. Windows up near the ceiling. Yes. Yeah. <gasps> and if you walk that midnight, you see bats the size of cows. <laughs> <laughs> and when it rains, it doesn't rain on that building. Yes. <laughs> when you're at All Saints mm. and it's raining, <laughs> it doesn't rain on that building. <laughs> <laughs> the things people will believe. Well. The Situation Room, Kenya's biggest conversation.
The weather with Spice it's FM. This morning, 17 degrees. We'll see highs of 29 and we'll see highs of 27 in a sunny Nakuru at 16. 14 and sunny in Yeri with highs of 28. And we're looking into a sunny Eldoret at 15 going to highs of 25. Mombasa is sunny at 28 with highs of 33 and we'll see highs of 33. In a mostly sunny Malindi at 28. Looking into Kisumu, it's cloudy at 22 with highs of 30, while in Kakamega, 19 degrees, sunny highs of 30 and lows of 17. Kampala's cloudy at 20 with highs of 29, while it's partly uh, cloudy at 28 in Dar es Salaam, going to highs of 31. Mogadishu this morning is sunny at 28 and Addis Ababa is sunny at 15 with sunny conditions in Johannesburg at 17. It's clear in Lagos at 26 going to highs of 34 and light rain continues in Kinshasa at 26 going to highs of 33. Up your here life. we are at a uh, few minutes after 7.30 into traffic hour proper and there really is traffic everywhere you look this morning. Haile Selassie, very busy. So if you're trying to get into the city centre, doesn't matter where you're coming from, quite some of it. And we know that folks are travelling all over the city and all over the country today as schools open today and tomorrow after the midterm. So that's where a lot of this traffic is coming from. So, you know, hang on, hold on to your horses. It'll dissipate at some point. On the thicker superhighway, heavy inbound traffic is still the same on Limuru Road as well as Kambu Road. We're well past the DCI headquarters junction, or rather gates. There was traffic this morning and well beyond Karura Gate C. So just in case you're there, it's going to take some time to get towards Mathaiga Square. It's heavy on Waiaki Way as you're approaching Westlands at the roundabout. And on Gong Road, uh, it's also very busy as well. Coming in from Naivasha Road, comes back onto Ngong Road and then into the CBD. All right, so we're into traffic hour and we're in it tight. Let's see what happens as we get through Spice FMKE on X hashtag, the Situation Room. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Right. 94.4 right. Spice FM. News with Alcags, the executive director of the Open Institute. So, how then would you like to phrase the conversation on debt? So, I think there's a couple of things that we, in my view, must do. Okay. Number one, let us begin calling spades spades. Mm -hmm. Let's stop calling them gilded spoons, golden, and other things. Mm. The challenge that currently exists, according to Treasury, is that 67% of GDP is being spent on debt. Mm. Maybe more. Do, do we know what of, that means? Of revenues. Does mm. your brother in the village know what that means? No. So Kenyans right now do not know what the issues are. Mm. The contracts that were done for the SGR, for Aror Kimwarer, for that wind turbine project that we were just talking about, all of these things are not public. So we don't, we all can speculate and maybe listen to Jimmy Wanjigi as he tells us what he knows, mm. but we haven't seen these documents, mm. so we don't really know. We need to know. Number two, our president has told us that he spends 7.2 shillings on debt and uh, three shillings on everything else. Everything else, but are we living like a country that um, is in dire straits? No. When you really think about it, we're not living like a country that is in trouble. If you think about your own house, which is how Kenyans would understand it, so you have debt from uh, KCB. Your SACO is uh, has given you a loan. You are almost defaulting. You have gone all the way down to Fuliza, to um, Tala, and all these other guys. You have got into a place to the where local you, are, kiosk. you are borrowing even from Mamamboga. Mm. Now, if you are in that particular situation, is that the time to buy a new car? Nope. No. But that's what we're doing, right? So that we can say that we're doing development. Mm. When there are government officials who have not been paid salaries in months, we are talking about this. Mm. At what point do we begin to get serious? Now, when I ask myself where the blame must go, mm. 
I realized that the blame must go to our representatives in parliament mm. because they allowed for parliament to become a department of the government and not just in this administration, even in the previous one. Yep. They allowed themselves to become a department that can be called into a meeting in Naivasha and told this is how you guys shall legislate. Mm. This is what your agenda shall be. Mm. And they allowed it, they allowed themselves to be so partisan that the truth is Kenyans don't have a say. Now, those two combinations are really dangerous because now we who elected these people who don't live in Nairobi, I've just described to you, mm. who dropped out of school in Standard 3, who are struggling day in, day out to make 300 bob. Who are in the majority. Who are in the vast majority are supposed to hold these buggers into account. Mm. And they don't ever come home. How do we hold them into account if we don't know what they're doing? Right. How do we hold them into account if when we open our TV, the president tells us we are now in dead distress? What does out of dead distress mm. mean? What should it actually mean? Dead distress should actually mean that to some extent we are producing something. Mm. To some extent there is employment and not that housing mm. project. That there is actual jobs for everyone. Um, and without the justification that is saying that kazi ni kazi, we have to now get serious about these things. One of the things that this government has found itself, and I think we have to depoliticize the situation we are in. Mm. It's not about Kini Kwanza and about Azimio. Mm. The fact of the matter is, if Azimio was here, they would be facing the exact same challenges. Yep. They would still be needing to pay that euro bond that was taken in 2014. Yep. And they need to pay it now. Mm. Right? So that's not a that's not a partisan issue. Mm. They might have decided to do one or two things differently, but they really, when you really think about it, are not going to be far off. The wiggle room is very little. little. Um, they still would have had to dance to the tune of um, our friends at the IMF. Yeah. Mm. We are slaves. Let's call ourselves slaves. Let's talk about how we free ourselves into slavery. In my mind, mm. we have to decide on what, how to renegotiate our debt situation. We have to get to a place, if we are talking about debts that we can prove are odious, then we must hold some people to account. Mm. For us to be able to do that, those documents must come public. So you're saying, for us to call a spade a spade, we must put the spade here. Right in front of everybody. And look at it. And look at it. And, and see, agree that, does yeah, it, and yeah, Does it actually form to conform to all the characteristics of a, what call what forms a spade yes does it have you know the, the shape of a spade of the, of the beginning does it have the shape of a spade at the end does it have a handle does it have is it a spade yes. then we all say it's a spade yes right now we are dis we are discussing something that we can't see we're just seeing bits of it it's like when i started texting you about this issue yeah i was getting very tired because of the fact that um we are really analyzing this how we got here and we've analyzed this so that I have seen so much analysis. I have even traveled here to Nairobi to go into some fancy hotels mm. and listen to some pundits tell us some really grim stories and really analyze. But you know what? We say that the, the SGR was overpaid by double or triple. Mm. Says who? Where did the money go? We say that we there was a subs subscription fee that was supposed to be 10%, but we upped it to just because we could to a 40%. Mm. Okay, fine. Can we track that money? Can we see that money? Mm. Can we see exactly how much has actually come into this country? Mm. Can we put that against this SGR and say, okay, ESGR made this idea. Mm. This expressway here helped me to get here in five minutes. Mm. But I don't know whether it was value for money because I've never seen the contracts that are involved with this. Mm. And Kenyans can read. Mm. Even those ones who dropped out of school Even that have community-based organizations that will read and will break it down for them and they will understand. So that they can be able to go to the Malindi MP and say, when you go back and you hear something like raise debt ceiling, tukwone yiku uki raise. Jaribu. But the fact that they do not have an understanding of all of these things that are going on, it becomes very difficult. Are you talking about civic education then? Okay. I'm talking about civic education, which unfortunately we only do once every five years. Yeah, 
we do when, voter education right we do voter education mm. we go and no even even um, even within our nonprofits we mm. do civic education at the end yeah so this is a young person who you're not telling to go and collect an uh, an id card at the very last minute to go and get their voters card at the very last minute and this is a person who's supposed to vote correctly mm. so uh, so um civic education is not something that should be a one time thing it shouldn't we are talking about a continuous process of insistent and deliberate education because all these times that we keep even we've heard it and it has become almost buzzword sometimes yes. leaders will say well you are the ones who voted us in then uh, we should be held to account but essentially what we are saying here is that if i if i if i don't share something with you the likelihood of me knowing that if you knew yes i would not be in this position it puts and me in a particularly sweet position doesn't it it does and you see we must keep our people busy so every time there's an accountability issue we say it is our people who are being targeted we yeah. and so on and so forth right yeah. we then make sure that it goes into court and somehow we don't know what happens then after a few years when we are supposed to have forgotten about it well you're released and we say that latif is now um acquitted yeah. because there was no evidence the fact that there was no evidence doesn't mean that latif didn't steal <laughs> right <laughs> but what who are we to say anything about it now the other thing about um calling spades spades mm. is that we need to um agree that parliament has to start doing its job mm -mm. allow me to just disagree <laughs> with you right there yes no that agreement won't work we can't get them to do their no, job no 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 i'm saying no for the fifth time you know but we are paying them a million shillings yes 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 the, the no here is not that i'm disagreeing with the principle of the uselessness of members of parliament there were we in complete agreement there yes the no no is because we cannot begin a statement that relates to members of parliament with a prescription that we must because that is the stock narrative and it hasn't worked we must begin with a completely different story and the story has to be with a question how do we get rid of our mp's or how do we ensure <laughs> that these people actually get to do what they are supposed to do because they won't but we have precedent well like when in 2011 mm. kenya was the first country to release open data um to the public mm. first country in sub saharan africa one of the data sets that was released was cdf what happened was that a number of uh, civil society organizations went to the ground mm. in western kenya and wanted to see where some of these projects were i think it was kakamega or mm. maybe bungoma i'm not sure which of the two or maybe busia i think it was actually one of the two mm. they went to this place it was a national taxpayers association at this time they mm. went and saw some villagers and said we've come to see x school mm. that was funded by the mps and they could not understand why um the locals were so amused <laughs> so they told let's go and they were taken to a beautiful field mm. nice and green and they're told voila here is your school there is a school <laughs> okay <laughs> that same period um we saw an mca who had spent 10 million shillings of whatever the word fund is mm. to 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 build um uh, public toilets that were actually four in number and that were pit latrines mm -hmm. 10 million did they exist they existed the mm. pit latrines the pit latrines they cost 10 million shillings they cost 10 million shillings so how so deep how deep were they 250000 a pop this is no, what i need to maybe they are kilometer deep. million for one no they also had maybe gilded you know maybe they are kilometer deep you have something to think i mean we have to think yeah <laughs> so citizens um from that area when they learned this now i want to pause there and say something mm. the truth that we have found as the open institute we did some research and we found all four of us and all other 50 million kenyans they care more about what is happening at home in their commute and at work than they care about the 17 billion shillings that we might talk about whatever we are talking about why is that yes, so no. why is that so because of the fact that this one they understand so one of the, one really? uh, there's a woman you who relate said to, to us you relate to it i relate to it look uh, there's a woman who said to me uh. i've never touched a million shillings mm. how am i ever going to understand what you're talking about when you're talking about a billion but now this is my thing uh, yeah. and that's why i always insist yes. people always say well, why do we have to keep talking about the things that are not working and i say if you do not yeah 
then you cannot make the connect between what is not working and what should be working. So, in your house, when at that time you're nine months pregnant and you're trying to make it across the river to a hospital that does not exist, right? In that moment, your reality is the 100 shillings that you yeah. have, that you're going to pay half of it to the border guy. Yes. And the other half, you're going to hold on to it and hope that maybe you'll buy a packet of milk for strength after you've delivered your baby. Right. That's your reality. You relate to that. In yes. that moment, you care about it. Yes. But then what we are maybe even calling actualization is when you realize that, okay, 17 billion shillings in Kenya today would mean that I, as a woman who is giving birth at nine months, does not have to get on the slippery slope with this border and go to a hospital that maybe does not exist. If it, was right app there. if it was applied in the right way, would that then become, and that my question after that whole narrative is, does that then become more relatable if you are able to connect with what is not happening and what should be happening? If. If. Here's the thing. I have 12 children. I dropped out of school at standard three. My wife dropped out of school at standard two because I made her pregnant. She was 13, I was 17. Mm. I need to feed all these mouths. All 13 of them. All 13 of them. Right. On 300 bob. Already as it is, even for you guys who are thumbed, mm. when you hear this story of mathematics, your eyes kind of glaze over. You're telling me who dropped out of standard three that I will understand what you're talking about when you say billion. Mm. Aki does not work. Mm. It does not work. So, what, so how should you have a conversation with that person that so person. they see? So I, before, I, before I go in, into how I want to have a conversation with that person, mm. <laughs> I want to go back to what you were saying, that we cannot get our MPs to do this precedent. The MCA who built those toilets, mm. this is what happened. People who understand how much it is to do a toilet latrines in their homes. Yep. So if you tell me you did four, all I do is I think back to my one. Mm. How much did I do one for? Right. So I did one for forty thousand or four hundred thousand. So so, forty thousand in Right. I've done for mine forty thousand. Mm. You you've done yours ten million. Mm. I want to know why. When they eventually went into some detail, because now that's something they can understand and they yep. can push. Yep. When they went into some detail, what they did is that they found that some of that money went into a benchmarking trip to Singapore. For the pit latrines. Yeah, so that we understand how, you know, to build the best San sanitation. You know, yeah. we want to global understand what, you know. Global standards. Mm. For global yeah, standards. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And then after that, there was some money to go and review the report in Mombasa and so on and so forth. By the time, you know, we get to the we needed a car. We needed cars. We needed a few things to be done. Got it. And a committee. Right, and the committee and, and, and you know committees are working very hard. You say they are working hard. They are working hard. I never said that. <laughs> they are working hard, boy, these people. Let me tell you, these people are spending sleepless two hours of a week yes. to be able to deliberate because they don't just talk, they mm. deliberate mm. on these issues. Now, when they have done that, when the citizens understood that, what they did mm. is that they made it impossible for MCA to go home to his mother's house. Uh -huh. They just made it impossible. He comes with his car, it is stoned and sent back. He comes with another car, the neighborhood hears that he is at his mother's house, they go into his mother's house and says, excuse, leave. Get out. Until he made good, and he did make good. I think that story was actually told in this standard. How many yeah. such stories do we get? So that's the thing. Last year, this past year, I saw... Um, in, twin, in in April, mm -hmm. I saw a community in Gede during the public participation tell the Kilifi County official who had come that we don't want to hear many stories. We hear you speaking English. Please, it's okay. Just tell us, this market that was completed but has not been opened for two years, that's all we want to know. Mm. What's the story? And when is it going to be open? This guy had come fully prepared with a presentation and all that. But what these people did is they said, no, we don't want to hear many stories, just this one. Our pain point is market. Is a market, just this market. Yes. Three months later, the market was open.
I keep seeing these stories in micro levels mm. everywhere. Now, when the only thing that gets these people to move is when they have actionable information, when they understand that information. So that if, mm -hmm. is when we have understood what, not even the 17 billion, mm -hmm. because 17 billion is it's national. Very, yeah. 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 Let's speak of the part of that that was in my ward. And yeah. then you just tell me if this little amount was coming to my ward, we would have had a hospital, the one that we need. Would now it, we are talking. Would it help if the citizen, the Moninchi we are speaking of, understood that this money we are speaking of is actually their money? The connection between it's, it's the billions. Fundamental. Yes. That's a and very complicated thing also. Mm. How I, complicated I, I go, is it? I go and ask uh, citizens mm. all the time that particular question between mm. you and president, who's the boss? Mm. They say, of course, the president. Mm. I say, but why? He says, when he comes here now, we will stand. Mm. He is the one who has uh, all the power. Mm. He has all the money. But whose money is it? Ah, it's his. It's not ours. If it was ours, we would know what to do with it. We know what to do with money. By the way, as Kenyans, we know what to do with money. So when you tell us that it is ours and we've never seen it, please. The, the thing that I'm trying to get us to understand here is that qua ground, vitun is different. There's yes, these things is, that we keep why saying. Why is it impossible for people to understand? Because if you look at our voting patterns, it more or less tells us that the so-called Monenji really understands their power. They do. It's the one thing they treasure. They know that with this, I can make a change. No. They know that with this, my guy can get back in. Uh, but now you see this way we <laughs> Because if we're saying this person is disempowered and yet you make a statement such as the one you make, then you're proving my point that he does understand that this thing gives them power. To do what? Now, that is where the, the, that's the crux of the matter. You see, you start from the known. Mm. Then you move on to these more complicated issues. Everything you've said, I, I, I completely agree with. The disconnect is I earn 300 shillings. That's mine. You tell me a thousand, you've removed me from my reality. How do I connect you to the thousand and then to the 10 and then to the 20? I would be more aggrieved and more incensed if somebody was wasting my money. Mm. It is not that they don't understand, in my mind. It is resignation. What we see is people who have resigned. They figured, yeah. you know this thing? Let me not bother my head too much about it. I have more pressing issues to attend to. Let me focus on these ones. So, so the thinking here is, this 300 bob that I have earned, I sweat, I toiled, I got the 300. I, I understand. It. It's my reality. I spend it. I spend it at uh, Babanani's shop. I buy. I spend it here. I pay for this. I go to the school. I pay Kidogo money. This is how I balance my life, right? Yes. Anything beyond this is coming from Nairobi. It's coming from Kilifi. Right? Yes. And it's it belongs to Nipesa Yamgaro and Nipesa Yaruto. Yes. It's coming. Mgaro has come, he's opening a project. Or Ruto was visiting the area and to Nairobi to Right? So how do we then connect? Do you think and this is just a random thought, eh? do you think the the fact that you are not out of this three hundred that you have earned? not a shilling is going as direct tax, then you don't connect with the fact that you actually removed some of your money to go into that pot. That you know, it is Ruto not impossible about. for people to understand these problems. It's just that I want to take you back to the statement I made a while back. Mm. People care more about what's happening home, commute, to work. Yes. So if you tell this person, this road that is coming to your, from your home to your work was supposed to have been fixed last year and the money was there, but it was not there. So please make sure you go to that public participation meeting and ask about that specific project because the money was there in the budget. They don't care how much money it was. No, no, no. Just that the money was there and it was, should have been Lamy and it is not even Maram. That's a question that they can go and ask and they can even... You know, it's something that we can get our head around. Don't tell me about the 17 billion. Don't tell me about 65 billion. Tell me this, that this 65 billion, when you disaggregate it, mm. it was supposed to be this amount in my ward, and it was supposed to be this thing. Can you see this window? From this road here to that Mamanani's shop, 
there we were supposed to have done something. You see there we were supposed to have done a bohol. If you tell me that as that person earning the 300 uh, bob mm. a day mm. now you have you have connected with me because I what you are saying is that I was supposed to have had a bohol here. But I don't. But I don't. Because. Uh, now, because. Right. Uh, what will happen is that I start asking some the tough wise. questions. <laughs> is it, look, even as I'm having all these conversations, I've got to go back to that point of whose money was supposed to build the road. Does the citizen directly see that this is their money? No. Or is it the MCA who was going to do it? Sasa sababu unajua sisi tulikuwa tumepigia MCA wetu si wa chama ya yes. governor sasa sisi ndio maana tunadhulumiwa sasa basi uchaguzi ujao mjue vile mtafikiria nyinyi watu yes mjue vile mtajipanga mahaki that is actually the reality on the ground so then there is no direct it's still feeling that whoever has the power of the past strings is the one who is donating yes. the money to you the connection that it's your money is still not there and also the fact that it's not specific yes when it is not specific when we are talking about money that should have come here to this community and so on and so forth it's still it's not over. specific mm. it's money it's it's something it's effervescent but if you actually went and told me specifics every time that i have been in a community where they had a discussion about specifics they held their leaders to account every single time yeah. without fail You know why I see a direct connection between people and the money? Yeah. Is for example in markets. Yes. Because traders at the market pay for the, the license. For the license to yes. sell their on a daily goods. basis. Yes. Then those ones are more organized and they're able to demand. Tunalipanga pesa hapa kila siku. Why is the toilet not working? Why is there no water? Why is the mulika mwizi not working? Yes. Why is the garbage not being collected? Silipi. Yes. So there's a direct connection. Yes. But beyond that that now school and everything else or road and road and hospital you feel like it's money that's we are going to grab money from Nairobi we yes. elected a very yes. powerful and, and and vocal person who's going to Nairobi to champion and I'm a grab I'm to let up the thing that we have to do in my view is that we have to figure out how to empower our people mostly mostly through civic education mm but trying to make sure that we get so specific that they can actually hold their leaders very specifically to account mm. let's not care about the the billions because now that is mathematics mm. just help me to understand this project so that they start asking right. very specific questions mm. that's what we want to have in the next hour we'll continue this conversation and open the phone lines many people commenting even on social media will be reading some of those comments al kags is the executive director of the open institute He's our guest. We've been having a dead conversation. What should we do next in our national discourse? 8 a.m. News time. Good morning. This is News Time. Dennis Aseto. Despite the government continued promotion of Azimio leader Raila Odinga's ambition to run for the position of Africa Union Commission chairperson, some Kenya Kwanza leaders now say President William Ruto will have an easy time to govern the country once Odinga leaves local politics led by Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly Gladys Bonds. They have said that they support Odinga's ambition, stressing that he is suitable for the position due to his long experience in political matters. Likewise, they have said that they are ready to approve the recommendations in the report of the National Dialogue Committee that is not go for the benefit of Kenyans. <laughs> This is Raila Odinga has expressed hope that the implementation of the report, that is the NADCO report, will solve the problems preventing the formation of the IEBC Commission. Speaking in Sindo, the South 
Cinder South, rather, the ODM members' registration campaign in the area. Adding a said the implementation of the NADCO report will enable the creation of REBC by involving all stakeholders and more transparency. Odinga has also said that the implementation will also avoid the situation where some members of parliament violate party rules and migrate without order. <laughs> Gidanguri MP Gathuriwa Mushamba has faulted the government for introducing the farm produce tax even as the government said it will review the law. Deputy President Rugat Gashagu last week said the provision for the tax in the Finance Act 2023 will be reviewed to suit farmers' needs. His remarks followed a backlash from farmers after the government sought a 5% withholding tax on farm produce. Omushamba said the provision is repressive to farmers. Now, women movement in Western region, led by the chairperson, Corny Lusweti, has promised to collaborate to reduce cases of high pregnancy in the region by providing counseling to girls. Bungoma imekuwa leading na, na watoto early pregnancies na hii Bungoma pia tunafanya a lot of mentorship mulisikia wanapeana pads, wakifanya a lot of mentorship kwa sababu tutaki watoto wetu wasichana wawe nyuma kwa sababu hawajasoma na hawazi kufikia opportunities so tume attack hiyo kabisa kakamega ima attack vihiga na Bungoma na sisi wote tunapea support Bungoma Women living with the disabilities are being urged to come forward to benefit from the movement's projects. Tumeanzisha ya kwamba hivu guvugu la mama, sisi nasi wa mama wale mavu tusiache nyuma. Kwa sababu we are also fighting for our space. Sababu tunajua ya kwamba, wakati mama anapigania nafasi yake. We are equally an equal woman. So tunataka pia space kwa hii mlembe women, tupate share yetu. We are also having our projects that tunataka zikue funded, ambazo tunataka kulenga kwa hiyo launch ya June. Ikuwe fund drive ambayo itakuja kusaidia wa mama wa mlembe ambao ni wale mavu, Kenya mzima. A form one student at Mubere High School in Embed and the base constituency transit county has drowned. And the base constituency police commander Selassie Muriti said the boy, 17-year-old Amos Wanjala Baraza, was stuck in the mud while swimming. Kwa hii muda wa nusu muhula ambayo umepi Kila wakati ungeliona watoto kwa barabara Wamefukusu ati kwa sababu hawajalipia remedials Hawajalipia mambo ya rim papers Tundaa kusema kwamba hiyo mpango pia Wakati shule sinafunguliwa kwa mula mfupe kwanzia jumatatu The command has also explained that Amos was together with three others Who raised the alarm to help save their colleague who was drowning This is news I'm Dennis Aseto Good morning One hundred two point five Spice FM, Kisumu. There's traffic on Magadi Road this morning. It's coming in heavy on Gatarangai out towards Langata Road this morning. It's going to, you know, snake along as till you get to that junction coming in from Galleria. All right, and then onto Langata Road. It's very busy as you have then uh, pass Rilo Dingaway at that junction and then head out towards Aerodrome. So it's very slow there. Jogo Road started early with traffic, as did Haile Selassie. And it looks like it's going to be like that for the next couple of days as folks get back and all over the country as schools reopen. So... Landis Road, very busy, inbound towards Kamkunji at the roundabout and then onto Haile Selassie. It crosses over with what's going up coming off of Uhuru Highway out into the CBD and then through towards Westlands. And look at that traffic that's coming in from Chiromo. And then on the other end from Wangari Mavaiwe, Limuru is giving. And then also into the CBD from Muranga Road. It's very heavy towards the Globe Cinema overpass. The thicker superhighway is not letting up either. Heavy, heavy, one more heavy traffic. Um, all the way from the junction of Outer Ring and Kiambu Road as well. Well past Karura Gate C now. Limuru Road is busy. It's coming in hot from a Village Market and even before that. And Red Hill, at the Link Road, is also busy as well. We are in traffic hour proper. It's a Monday. It's crazy. You need your wits about. Let us know what's going on in your neck of the woods and we can spread the word. Keep things moving this morning. We'll talk on Spice of MKE on X hashtag The Situation Room.
This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is The Situation Room. It the is only the only way, way to, start to start your day. day. It's also the only way to know about Ekbank and where it operates. 35 <laughs> countries in Africa, four countries outside Africa. Getting onto the one platform where mm. your banking transactions continue, regardless of where you go, where you land, or where you move to. Yes. So because of that one banking group and saying that one platform that you've plugged into, how about a seamless way of doing business, that you can pay your bills even when you travel, that those who depend on you can t continue to do so, mm. really doesn't matter where you are. It's a fantastic idea to make sure that you don't have to close anything down or move just because you do. And uh, because of that, it's a better way. And it's a better Africa. A better way. A better Africa and they have got many branches in Kenya and agency banking in Kenya so if you open an account with Ecobank today you can transact within very the many branches in the country and also you can go and deposit withdraw money from the agency banking network across the country it's a big thing as we talk about the plan the country has many plans the individuals in this country also have their very many plans I see Alliance says, whatever your plan is, please talk to us. And they say, if you send us an email today at plan at ICEALion.co.ke, that's plan at ICEALion.co.ke, we'll get back to you. We'll have a conversation. So what's your plan? What do you want to do? How can we help you actually think through your plan? How can we help you actualize your plan? What do you need to do? Maybe just set aside 10 bob a day, 200 bob a month, whatever amount, and you're working towards your goal and your plans for you know short-term plans medium-term plans long-term plans it's good if you start early so i know there are very many students who listen to us on a daily basis mm -hmm. and all of them are thinking and i've got a whole life ahead yes that's true and it's actually the best time now to start thinking of that whole life ahead of you by putting a plan into action i see a lion plan at i see a lion dot co dot ke al kags Executive Director of Open Institute stays on for the next hour. We open up the phone lines. We read your comments on social media, on YouTube and Facebook and X as well at Spice of MKE. What should we be discussing of, about now to make sure that everybody in the country understands? So this is what we talk about debt. This is how then we control our debt. So that our future generation, future, they'll be looking back and thinking, well, there were some people who, there were some thinkers mm. in the country in the year 2024. City. Yes. The thinkers of the country called Swatini, that's what you're saying it. <laughs> it's called Swatini. <laughs> <laughs> it's written as Swatini, but it's pronounced Swatini. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> give us the proverb. A man who prides himself in his on his ancestry mm. is like a potato plant. The best part is underground. The best part is underground, mm. right? And al looked at that and said, okay, now, <laughs> think about the future generations that will be priding themselves in their ancestry, and we are the ancestors. Mm. <laughs> and then look and say, hey, we had some really, really useless ancestors. <laughs> Do you guys worry that... We had um, some proper potatoes <laughs> for ancestors. <laughs> Potato heads. Do you guys worry that every time we talk about national heroes, we are still talking about people who lived in 1940? Yeah. We do. The question we want to ask is, should we redefine the terms by which we bequeath someone that title of hero, or is it that we no longer have heroes? Actually, we have redefined it. If you look at the every December 12th, if you look at the lists that are there, uh, we have redefined oh, it. Oh, for crying mm. out loud. Yeah. <coughs> we have redefined it. 
Mm-hmm. Here's the thing that I'd love to see. Mm-hmm. And here's what I'm hoping Kenyans are going to echo. That the fact of the matter is kwa ground vitu ni different mm-hmm. and we have to get our people ready to hold their MPs to account. Not change. Let's not get rid of the same buggers. Mm-hmm. Because you mm-hmm. know what? You get rid of them, you get others. Mm-hmm. And they are the same. same ca- mindset. Ca- you know, these guys all want to survive. Because they want to survive, let's just make it, you know, if you have real supervision, you do your job. Yeah. Right? So let's just give them real supervision. Whoever is there, even if it's a potato, mm. they will do the job just right so long as they know, if I don't do my job right, this is, what this is the consequence. And you know the beauty about MPs especially, the consequence on the ground can be very real. Mm. But the people have to understand what it is. Now, there's a bunch of um, civil society organizations that are running something called Okoa Uchumi. Mm. And one of the things they have been suggesting is that we should get our mm. government to say, can't pay, won't pay. Mm. I've heard them even, some of them talking here on this yeah. studio saying, can't pay, won't pay. Yeah. Great. No problem. Yeah, let's say it. Let's do whatever it is that we need to do. But the one other thing that I'm hoping that this government will click and understand especially once they've taken the money out of our pockets for a minute, or when they've taken their hands out of our pockets to mm-hmm. pick whatever is left, mm-hmm. is this, that the country can only grow when business grows, and therefore we need to focus our attention on building not those large businesses. I saw in the standard today we're talking about the dead economy. Not those large, large businesses. Those ones are important. But imagine if we make it possible for millions of cottage industries to thrive. Imagine if we made it possible for people to import machinery, not products, so that they can come here and they can produce. And then we created um, markets for them, not Europe, not UAE, just here in Africa. So you told me Ecobank here in Africa, eh? Mm. just here in Africa. Let's sell in Ghana. If you go to Ghana today, I saw that they're taking milk powder. We have lots of cows. Yep. Please, let's just help these people. Mm. Yeah. Let's go to Chad mm. and, and send uh, wh- Why beef. do you want to go far as far as Ghana? Just go to DRC. DRC here. we're told. Mm. Yes. All right? Mm. Let's, let's actually create those markets mm. and let's make it possible for people in Kilifi, in Makweni, and so on to <laughs> produce so that they can package and they can send. All you need to do for that to happen because Kenyans are wily people. Yeah. Just make it possible for them to get credit, make it possible for them zero rate. Yeah. Mm. All machines that would help them to do this work, leave it to them, they will do it. If the president truly wanted to create employment, it is not through 10,000 houses here and 5,000 houses here where you've created a whole bunch of Njengo people. It is where you've created a whole ecosystem of people coming up with great ideas and doing stuff. Or supporting them because I tend to believe, and here we are, because one of two things happen. when Because looking at this debt issue, and the question has come out over and over and over again, then what must happen? So two things, you pay the debt, but then you also put yourself in a situation whereby you are making your own money. Right. So that you don't have to go into a situation Correct. whereby you are debt dependent. Yes. Isn't it? Yes. And one of the ways to then make the money, because I think we often get it confused, it's not the government's business to create jobs. So every time somebody says, I want to come and create jobs, I often get very uncomfortable yes. when a would-be president or would-be leader says, I'm creating jobs. I'm creating jobs. It's not your job. Yes. <laughs> you're not supposed to be doing that. Yes. What you must do is create what you're saying now, an environment where these things then will naturally right. happen. That your people are innovative. They are. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about the person with a PhD yes. or the person who knows how to weave a basket. Yes. Your people are naturally innovative and they're actually quite resilient. They will have the ideas. They will create. Your job is to make sure that the environment where they operate is conducive for these things to happen. Right. So to make the basket, do they need access to credit? They do. Ooh. Can you make sure your structures are there to make sure that they can have access? Not to go and bring your great-grandfather's first wife's right. ID. No, yes. can you make it possible for them to do this? Then the person with the PhD, if you have granted him or her the education that they need, and then now that they are saying, here are policies that would work, how about you then implement them Yes. and make it possible for them to work? But then we seem to be stuck 
with that big I word. The implementation of these things, and so my question is here, why is, is, is implementation an issue? Why? Because that seems to be the thing. We talk about this milk powder, for example. Why? We throw milk. It's, it rained. Gidhongori, they threw milk away again in 2023. Again, there was a glut. We threw milk away. Then we and have bumper harvests saying, of, of maize and we throw that away as well. Yes. Mm. And we're saying that DR Congo, a plane ride away, three hours you're there. We're saying that uh, there's a market there. Uh, what, what's the link here that needs to happen? You know the, the you know what the problem, as I understand it, and I think I agree with you on this one, it is the fact that we have a, such a poor mentality, we have such a now mentality. We have, we want to eat on, we want to eat everything that is on the buffet now, because we cannot create an environment where we can continue having a buffet every day. We can't think tomorrow. We have to think today, and every time that you have these conversations where you're saying, look, let KPLC not make a profit. Mm for the next five years but make sure that the cost of power actually goes down mm -hmm. to a place where that allows for everyone to thrive everyone who has a machine can thrive and and do their business mm. i went to a factory in mombasa the other day and i saw that they only operate at certain hours of the day and they have reduced their production times to a third for two reasons it's just too expensive um, to run the machines, mm. and there's not enough people buying. Mm. Mm. So that means that they've actually fired people. Mm. There's an informal uh, research that was done the other day that um, I saw on Twitter that said that many companies that used to have five people, ten people, that level of company now have two. And they are moved from their original office that was in Kilimani, for example, or in town or whatever, to uh, Roaka or um, somewhere outside town mm. where it is cheaper for them to operate. Yeah. I saw in Kilifi a person who used to have a printing press. A printing press is probably the size of this room. Mm. He used to have a printing press in Mombasa doing business cards, etc., etc. Life became so impossible. So now he has taken his printing press to Kilifi. To rural Kilifi, a place called Matsangoni, mm. he has gone and uh, created a room there where mm. he can now do the, his printing press. He has fired most of the people that used to work for him. Mm. He is now looking for jobs in Mombasa. Once he gets those jobs, he comes, he prints, then he goes back that way. That is what is actually happening on the ground in this economy. If we want, if the president truly wants to create um, employment in this place, then all he has to do is to actually let that guy in Matsangoni thrive. Mm -hmm. Because that guy in Matsangoni is going to re-employ people in Matsangoni, train a few more young people, and we'll start to see difference, a different uh, sort of atmosphere. Mm. The, the way that we're going right now, where you know, we're taxing everything soon, we're going to be taxing oxygen, it's just not going to work. It's not helping. But then there's the issue of accountability that you talked about. And... and the example of Professor Kivuda Kibwana and Makweni comes to mind because he's even sat here and we asked him, and I've been to Makweni and I've also asked him directly, so what is it that you are doing? And he said, you know what, it's a people-centered governance system yes, where every decision is made with the people in mind, where the local market people had on their notice board the county's budget and the amount of money that has been earmarked for this particular market and the project. And whether we're doing phase one, we shall be able to do this and that, we shall put up the lights in phase one, and this is the amount of money. And these are the people who are in charge of that. And the next one, we shall be doing the wall for the market. The next one, we shall be doing the toilets and all. And then the people then are more involved in saying what is a bigger <coughs> concern for them. Is it the lights? Is it the toilet? Is it the wall? Is it the water? And in fact, he talked about a, a, a project which was supported by, you know, some uh, development partner came in and they wanted, I think, to do lights. Was it lights or was it uh, public toilets? But the market community said, no, 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 no. Our priority right now is not this. 
it is actually we want to make a movie so then if the lights are on we can work on later we can close our businesses much later we'll be able to earn more and they had to change it because the people said this is what we need and they knew how much and they they said that because the governor came and told them so we have gotten some help from this particular donor and they're saying they'd like to help us with this particular project what do you think public participation started yeah it's a good idea but how about we start with this and then we can go into this and we can even save some of that money and you see it's people understanding from the basics from my local like you said if i understand what is affecting me and how much it costs then now from after i've gotten that sorted i can start talking about the bigger thing so my market all right so let's talk about the other things that happen let's talk about all right mango we want to create a market for mangoes we'll be doing this we'll be forming ourselves into groups we'll be sending our mangoes into this particular cooperative then the cooperative then you're going to put money into putting a factory in uh, water that factory then will take all our mangoes and you know people start now connecting and seeing this is what is important and as soon as they see that they immediately decide you know what? i'm going to get a loan from the sako to buy a pickup yep because i can <laughs> see there's going to be business people once you, once government creates the environment people will do what they need to do to create prosperity they do not need for government to actually create the projects for prosperity but does it then not mean that they do understand with great clarity what they can do but they limit their aspirations or the exhibition the aspirations because of the limited circumstances the example of makweni is an excellent one because the first term of governor kibwana he actually physically went into a public participation program for his people he mm. he personally yes yes with his people so when your governor is telling you what we are saying here and saying this is actually your money it is you who needs to tell through your mcs what you want to do with this man it is your money mm. and he does that effectively it is because of that that i believe he had the confidence to say look if the mcs want have this gotten to this point where they want me out let's just break this thing up and go for re-election mm. and when indeed the five years were up <coughs> literally all the mcs bar one were exited by their own people okay now he led from the front by example okay it's unique yeah. now how many other governors can we even say entertain the thought forget doing it doing it begins entertaining the thought because mm. if they did it the message would be home because this is the governor the, the person who you know as the boss telling you mm. actually this is your money you will believe him because he's telling you i actually think we should move away from looking and expecting the governors to come and 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 emulate professor kivuda kibwana we should ask we the citizens to emulate the citizens of makueni county right right so that then all of us can start saying ah wait a minute aya kuja at you mesema unataka kutengeneza barrows nairobi okay barrows ni nini let us see right <laughs> barrows Here, here's the thing yeah. there is a system around citizens that currently exists yeah often times when we look at that system we think about the government side where we think about the um the mcas and the chief and so on yeah but in the non-profit side there's a whole bunch of people that i i call them change makers because i have met so many around this country i met them in nandi i met them in kilifi i met them in mombasa i met them even here in nairobi these are guys who he's a guy he works as a makanga he gets 600 bob and he uses 300 bob to go and educate his community through something called magnet theater mm -hmm. on something that is relevant to that community on how to change behavior in some ways i am seeing community based organizations that are using that small platform to pull 3000 women together so that they can tell them that you have power i have seen community based organizations that are working with those young women that I was telling you about who are mm. getting their first child at age 13 and saying you know what you can choose not to get another child so that this one we manage one because otherwise we will manage 12 like your mom and you can see your mom 
isn't doing well with this thing. Mm. These community-based organizations, these change makers, these magnet theater guys who are working within the community, those are the guys that we need all of us to support. And we support them not even with money per se. Money is great. Mm. But even just making sure that they have the correct information, making sure that we are reaching down to them. We have people in rural Kenya. Mm. There's an influencer, a YouTuber who has hundreds of views and he's in Tana River. Mm-hmm. And he's not speaking Kiswahili. Mm-hmm. He's speaking Orma Mm. and pokomo and pokomo you, you know what i mean mm. if he, if you've got that person who then can understand properly and can and has a following and that following is not a nairobi following and you get that person to actually begin to do civic education if we decentralize the idea of civic education so that we are not waiting for the large open institute or the whatever organizations to go down to the ground to do it one of the things that we will see is a groundswell of people having a better understanding of what it is that they're looking for. Mm. When I was telling you about that Gede story, what had preceded it was that community-based organizations had gone into those communities with Manila papers as tools and said, what is the most important thing in this community? Mm. And they wrote it down on the Manila papers. So when people went to public participation, they went with knowledge. Yeah. One of the biggest challenges within public participation is the fact that when I go alone, I'm afraid. Yep. Mm. In Kiambu, we saw a woman who said something that was unpopular and she was shouted down by the rest of the people who were there. Yep. Forget by the government. Yep. In fact, she became so afraid. What if we created an environment where she goes with a bogey of people mm. who believe what she believes? If those who shout, she can also shout. And therefore, there can be a discussion. The thing that we have to create around the, the citizen on the ground so that they have that information that we want, is just to activate those small networks. But then, what you're saying has been said before. What you're saying, you know, in terms of how do we make sure that we have CBOs that are active, CBOs that um, feel supported, and I guess maybe what they also need is that support in terms of information, proper information that then they break down and they can use to go to the communities with on a regular basis, trust with the information, and then upwards where you need more activism and lobbying at a higher level, yeah. you support them also going up. You've said that and I've remembered last week when we were in uh, Kilifi yes. for a conversation about climate change and climate action. Yes. I came across this guy, let's just call him a young man, who is a leader of a community-based organization that took a matter to court regarding the exportation of the baobab tree yes. from Kilifi. And these are guys from just local community who are active. They heard, okay, so this mze is the one from whose farm the big baobab was. And they went to that mze and asked, mze, did you give them permission to take the baobab? Hey, well, they said, I'm going to get a job. I'm going Ah, wakifanya utafiti sasa wakiona kama huu mbuyu wangu sasa ume, umetosha nitalipa pesa zangu and it's like you see the kind of information that people advantage. have been given is just being taken advantage of and raising that to the ministry of environment <coughs> up to a point where so ipantu had said pause unfortunately it continued but getting into that level what can the open institute do to then support mm. vertically going down and going up that community based organization to be properly resourced with information and also to be supported in uh, national advocacy. So what we have done mm. um, since 2020 is that we actually have created a space called Maono Space that is in Malindi that currently has 700 members. Mm-hmm. It's a co-working space, kind of like all these co-working spaces that we have here in Nairobi. But for those organizations to actually be able to do three things, they can meet they can work, mm-hmm. they can network, they can work, and they can collaborate. Those three important things. Mm-hmm. Because of the fact that they don't need to now pay for office spaces, they don't need to pay for internet and all these things. They all come to one place and they start working and they are doing some amazing things. Some of them, I think I'm seeing them on our, mm-hmm. on our uh, channel here mm-hmm. um, commenting. So that's a powerful um, thing. And because of the fact that they're coming together, it becomes then possible for CT to come to Malindi and sit with them as a group and actually impart some knowledge that they will then use back on the ground. What are the kind of jobs that these guys are doing? 
they're doing something called magnet theater, which I learned about only two years ago. And what magnet theatre is, is that they go into a, they're, they're thespians who go into a mm. village. Yeah. They actually begin to do their skit and people come to watch that and then they start engaging them on the real issues. I'm seeing them grabbing knowledge from all kind of places so that they can be able to take it down to their um, communities at very, very low costs. We're doing this now in, in Nandi. We are now starting to do that in, in Nandi as well. And we are seeing some amazing um, community-based organizations that are doing that. Mm. But also we are seeing photographers um, starting to create photo stories that they are publishing um, so that then, you know, it, in, it inspires action out of people in the middle class who sometimes we have to bring art to them so that they can be... Mm you know, inspired to, to do something mm. because they will not go down to the ground. Um, and that sort of experience that we have been seeing has proven to us that if you can be able to organize change makers on the ground, these guys are actually going to make um, their MPs, their MCAs become a lot more accountable. We are seeing that in like, you know, in, in true color. Mm. And so if we can, if we can expand that, if all these large organizations like the Open Institute, because we will not be able to cover all 47 counties in this way. Mm. If we have large organizations all doing the same thing, they stop going in their land cruisers um, mm. onto the ground. Because, you know, the, the analogy that I've been using maybe too often lately is I've been asking Latif, who can tell you that you smell and you need to shower? Your sister. Has to be somebody mm -hmm. extremely close to you. Yep. Mm. Yep. It can be a stranger. Mm. But we have situations where we go in land cruisers and we go all the way to a village and start telling people, you know, you guys, eh, mm. you need to change your behavior. Mm. It cannot work. Mm. Civic education cannot, have, cannot happen when we get a million dollars, which a lot of these organizations are doing. Yep. And then they buy a land cruiser and they drive it to a village to try and tell people something in broken English, mm, in the uh, you know, in, in bro broken Kiswahili, mm. trying to explain something to them. Mm. If they were actually serious, then what they do is that they actually begin to empower those civil society organizations that are on the ground, those community-based organizations, those yeah. change makers, yeah. and those guys, because they already know what the fears of the people are, they already have the trust of the people, those are the guys who will actually make sure. And if you, if you really take a look at mm. any village mm. where you are seeing very progressive action, Chances are there's some change makers behind that action. And it's already happening. So and it's we, happening. Pause. Let's take a break. It's 26 minutes to nine. Al Kags, the executive director of the Open Institute, is our guest for this hour. And we are discussing what should we move this conversation to next? 11.3 trillion shillings is our debt burden. If you just look in the last 20 years since Moe Kibaki said, let all the children go to school in January 2003 if you just look at all those years we have spent about the same amount of money on education about 10 trillion shillings if you just think about it but still today al -Kags, you just shared a photo of a school that you visited it's a mud world school no window no desks and this is in this country and yes. what which year was this that you took the photo Th it was two weeks ago three weeks ago three weeks ago yes in this country in mm. this country just here to in Kilifi. yes okay with all that money, why do we still have this? Why do we still have very many children dropping out of school because of, you know, all these problems? What should we do, be discussing next? We'll open the phone lines after this break. 0719 600 This is The Situation Room. The only way to start your day. It's critical that people pay taxes. But then, taxation has to have a limit. When you start overtaxing people beyond certain limit, then this is now we call robbery with violence. We are all struggling, but we don't show. If you're not doing well, shame on you. But you have to say, I'm broke and I'm struggling. <laughs> we are not okay until everybody is okay. okay. We are pretending to have political parties. Why don't we just be honest? And we say, these are the lawyers, these are the Kambas, these are the Kikuyus, and we are find ourselves in Kenya. You know, with, with politics and leadership, no matter what you do, mm. there will always be a complaint. <laughs> there will always be the assumption that you're either stealing or you're not doing things right. For, as a leader, don't fear. If you know you're doing the right thing, you've thought about it, you've got an expert advice, do it, then understand later. This country, we don't need prayers. Prayers mm. is between you and God. Good governance, 
and thinkers who care about the country and not their stomach. Yes. That's what we need. The Situation Room, Kenya's biggest conversation. The weather with Spice FM. 28, and has 28 as well in a sunny Nakuru at 20. 19 and sunny in Nyeri and going to highs of 28 and we'll see highs of 26 in a sunny Eldoret at 18. Mombasa is sunny at 29 and at 30 Malindi is also sunny. 24 and sunny conditions in Kisumu with 23 and sunny conditions in Kakamega. 21 and cloudy in Kampala going to highs of 29 and in a cloudy Dar es Salaam at 28 we'll see highs of 31. It's 19 and sunny in Johannesburg going to highs of 27 while in Mogadishu at 31 we'll see highs of 34 and Addis at 16 will go to highs of 24. It's clear in Lagos at 26 going to highs of 34 and now showers have turned into full-on rain in Kinshasa at 26 going to highs of 32. So it's a very, very busy morning. Which Nairobi streets don't have traffic, perhaps, is the question we should be asking. Let's look at what's happening from Red Hill, then going towards um, Greater Limuru Road, and then connecting with what's coming off of United Nations Avenue. Quite some traffic there. Figiri Ridge going in from Kitisuru out towards um, Peponi. That's all very, very busy this morning. Um, the Red Hill Link Road, where you are escaping traffic, coming off of James Gishoro, crossing over Waiaki Way is bumper to bumper. So if you were using that as an escape route, heads up, you might want to think again. And I know if you're going to go down Waiaki, where you're going to find that traffic as well. Ooh, so it's a tight situation here. Which way will you go? Um, you might want to just uh, hedge your bets and just go down Waiaki way for now. Um, you might stay on the roads longer if you use Red Hill. Am I wrong? Let me know, please. There's an absolute mess on the thicker superhighway this morning. It is not pretty at all. Coming in all the way from the outer ring junction down to the city and this whole mishmash of traffic coming in from Mudaiga Square off of Kiambu Road. Uh-uh. It's crazy this morning, guys. Um, and we're still in traffic hour. We will be for a while. Do you find an alternate route? <gasps> the Southern Bypass. I don't know how you're going to get there from where you are, but think about it. We'll talk on Spice FMKE on X hashtag The Situation Room. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. Angela is saying that in the Spice account, F traders in Luanda and Kilingili have refused to pay levies until the market is completed. Kilingili has only one toilet. And the traders have said, you know what, why are we paying? For only one and there's only one toilet now you can imagine if there's only one toilet is garbage being collected from this market and all the other things so these are issues that are happening and people when people see and they feel the pain and they can see direct action they take direct action ct you wanted to ask a question before you took a break i was actually going to make a statement mm -hmm. that um the change that we're looking for well, no let me begin the question sometimes it, it, one seems to be walking on a treadmill, you don't seem to be making progress. We're saying things, we mean them. If we're doing things, they mean them. How do we know that we have achieved what we set out to achieve? How do we measure success? When do we know we have succeeded? When you know, okay, we haven't gotten to where we wanted to go, but the journey has started. Mm. That's my question. Now, my statement is, I think there is more change than we acknowledge. Mm. I was thinking about this. And I think the current president we have is the right president for the situation that we are in. Mm. I'll tell you this. You see, the, one forgets that when political promises are made, at some level there's the intention to actually get them done. Then there's this little issue of being the president, realize you actually can't do the things you said you're going to do. You actually can't. You, you may be trying, you may be pulling strings, but you can't. The burden of having raised hopes then comes into play because people expect. And why? Because they don't have. So when you say you're going to bring it, they expect it. Now, when they don't get it, then they react. So even people who ordinarily would not react. Why am I saying it's a good thing? If people can react 
to the president of the nation, then there's no one they cannot react to. And that's what I'm saying. It is a good thing. And it's a good thing promises were made. And it's a good thing promises are difficult to keep. Because the person expecting the fulfillment of the promise doesn't care how difficult it is. You made the promise, keep it. That's as far as they're concerned. Mm. So I am saying that I foresee a situation when more and more leaders are going to be held to account. If I am to believe the clips I've seen of the president going somewhere and he's making a speech and the people just chatting away and dancing and singing, or he goes somewhere and there's a crowd, whether that crowd was paid to do whatever they were doing, but that people can have the courage. We've never seen it in this country mm. where a president is spoken to directly by a crowd. Mm. Or you call for a meeting and hardly very many people actually attend. They are speaking with their feet. They are telling you, look, we are not going to continue with what we are doing. Now, mm. when that happens, it, can, it will get cascaded. It means CSs beware, governors beware, MPs, you are already in trouble. MCAs, you are done for. Because if people see that the president can be told, we are not, you haven't delivered what you said. Yeah. You, anybody who's after that, you will have the same story and you'll be told. So the changes that we're talking about, they're actually with us. Mm. We don't have to look very far. True. Mm. Yes. And the fact that these promises are actually documented. Yes. You know, there are several charters that were signed with various interest groups, the farmers, the youth, the teachers, the doctors. They, you know, it's documented. Mm. These are our issues. Are you going to address them? Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll address them. We'll address them. We'll address them. It makes people now have something against which to judge yes. the administration. You said you are going to have a 50-50 split of women in top levels of government. Okay. How many do we have? Okay, we are looking at it and checking. You said the medics, this is what's going to happen to the medics. You said in agriculture, this is what's going to happen. So we are advancing in our politics, and I agree with you, CT. The fact that we are where we are, the fact that our politics is shifting this way, it's shifting into issues at that top level. Yes. Can it come down yes. to community level where it's also issues at community level? Hmm. And how just, do we bring it yeah. there? Yeah, how do we bring it there? And uh, I'll, even as you talk about that just linked into that some of the things that we were discussing is if we're saying how do we bring it to that point how do we talk about how do we institute these things today as opposed to them being aspirational i see it as then being directly linked to people who want to come into positions of leadership for issues and not because of their social expediency or any kind of political position but really do then have a heartbeat for the development and the sustainability of this nation. How do you make the connect with making these things happen and putting in leaders who you know, for example, is going to bring together that reality that you face on a daily basis? And I think that often is the Achilles heel because we say, how? How do people, th how do people vote? Because we know that there's a direct relation war perceived or otherwise, between the leader that you get and the vote that you cast. How do you make, how do we get people to make that decision hmm. now based on issues? Do you know something? I don't think there's any way in the world where politicians are doing great things because they should do great things. Hmm. I think they are doing great things. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing because they're being watched extremely closely by their people. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so there's no running away from where who bells the cat. The person that bells the cat has to be the citizen. And therefore you have to think about the, the place where the citizen is operating. But the other thing that we have to think about, which we have not talked about, mm. is this. I've never seen a shower. I've never seen it. Can I aspire for it? If I've never seen a shower, you don't know it. if I've never seen water fall from the roof and I can walk into there and it is warm and I can shower with it, if, can I aspire for it? No. Right? No. Um, many people will tell you that for them to aspire for the, the jobs that they have become successes at today, they saw somebody. Yep. Many people drive a Mercedes Benz or whatever it is. When you ask them, when do you really want to drive a Mercedes? You discover he was given a lift sometime when he was a young person. You know, I actually heard my friend Abel Mutua say that. 
that uh, he really wanted to drive a Mercedes and because he saw a newscaster driving a Mercedes, he decided the way that he is going to drive it is by becoming a newscaster himself. What mm. am I saying here? Is that the content of what we aspire to sometimes, even in our leaders is wanting. It is that they have never seen it. <laughs> so I have become an MCA, but really the farthest I have gone is uh, Eldoret Town. And I mean, you know, somewhere in Wasingishu. How many ten? Right? Mm. The farthest I have been is Eldoret. Mm -hmm. So when you're telling me that I need to aspire to a place that has walkways and all these things, <laughs> well, nah, it can be difficult. Mm. So, social media makes it possible. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the truth of the matter is it doesn't for many people because of the fact that you and Imam we don't know how it works. And then now, it becomes worse for the people who are supposed to hold him to account. Because him, he has gone to Nairobi and gone into a UN conference and mm. they've talked to him about walkways and whatnot. And he's thinking about, okay, so we can create a system for uh, is, is that why we pedestrian traffic. Is that traffic. why that particular class of individuals like benchmarking? That's why they love benchmarking. But they, no, no, well, they like benchmarking because they can go shopping. Because yeah, even even when I used to work for government and we'd go to conferences, we would be in the we would have gone maybe fifty of us, but in the actual conference room there's only twenty of us. Yeah, the rest the of the others are H and M. Yeah. Um, yes, you know, buying a few things for the children. Mm. Of course, the, you know, this uh, been spending their per diem. Mm. I can tell you, uh, having worked for government um, many years ago, the number of people that we got out of very questionable places. Um, because now they had had too much fun. Mm -hmm. What too many? These are things that, uh, especially those guys who handle logistics when these people travel abroad, they have to deal with. Look, the thing about it is this. We have to now start to work on that thing that your city was talking about, which was making sure that if we can't get them educated, then we get them exposed. Hmm. Okay? Who? Uh, the leaders or the people? No, the people. The people. Right. If we can't get the, the leadership comes from the people. Mm -hmm. If we can't mm -hmm. get, uh, look, if, we, if, if I am Benjamin, I am 24, I dropped out of school um, when I was in standard two. I have never been into a supermarket and I cannot imagine what a bank looks like. Then uh, let's just do what an, uh, there's an organization in, in Mauna called Lit is doing. What they're doing is what they call functional literacy. They're taking this young man and sh telling him what the government looks like and, and so on and so forth. Then at the very end of the course, they're saying, let's go on a trip. And they take them, guess where? Naivas. Mm. And just show them how to buy things in a supermarket. And it blows their mind that mm. I can literally just collect things from the shelf. shelf. Mm. And nobody's going to ask me. That blew that young man's mind to the extent that now he has something greater to aspire to. I saw him being taken to a circle for the first time, open an account and take a picture and post it on all his social medias to say, I have an account. It's like a big deal. He does not put the minimum of that circle, but every month he puts in 500 bob. The minimum of the circle is 2,000. Uh, 500. Mm. But just the fact that he is still saving that 500 bob is a big thing for me because this is a person who would eat everything that was in his mm. Mm. coffers. Now he's at least saying, if I put this one, something will happen. Can you see where I'm coming from? Mm. Yeah. So where I'm coming from is that it is time that we start to spend a little bit more of our energy to first of all get all Kenyans to realize that Nairobi is not Kenya and that the way that Nairobi operates is not um, the way it should be operating. That the way development is being discussed in parliament and in these other places where it is that we increase the debt ceiling so that we can borrow even more so that we can buy new um, SUVs. And so that when we go on, and on to, what is it called, the national days and we see mm. our people coming in the latest model SUVs, then we can say, wow, 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 I'm to wait. Mm. The only way that we do that is if we begin to expose our people, because maybe we miss the boat on properly educating them, but if we expose them, they begin to, to say, it's past my time, but my child will stay in school. But I'll think about this for a second. Eh? The ethos that we speak of a time gone by began with education, yes, 
And the example of the benefit of education was, it would be said, I remember my father telling me this, somebody builds for their, doesn't build a house first, puts iron sheets on the roof. Mm. Nobody else has it, that's education. The next thing you see that person driving a car. People then aspire to go to school because they say, wait a moment, but we know so and so. So this is what education does. Mm. Uh, then uh, this going to school is a very good thing. But somewhere along the line, the issue of just working and ensuring that what you earn from your work is what gives you what you need shifted. It shifted monumentally. It is now, what can you steal and yet call it business? What can you pilfer and then call it a deal? And how quickly can you acquire these monuments of wealth, these things that show? And then how conspicuously can you consume it so that people can see that you have actually arrived? Because that is the prevailing ethos. Yes. And with that ethos comes a never-ending appetite for more of the same. Now, many of our people who are in leadership may not know this, but it's Chapter 101 of a poverty of spirit. Many of these leaders have a poverty of spirit. And they, don't, they, they don't even know it. And the psychology that they function with is one of poverty. The cognitive ability to think, reason, and all that begins and ends with how can I acquire more? Now, once you become a slave to that, it doesn't matter. The next opportunity to receive money overtakes everything else. But to justify it and to tell yourself that you're in, on the right path, we then hear the statements politicians make, mm. how we are going to do this, and this is for the people. And yet, if that is the example, if that is the exposure, and you correctly put it, Al, <coughs> what do we expect those who are coming after us? What do you think they are seeing? That is the example they are seeing, and because they see it often enough, we've normalized it. Yes. Here's the thing. We will not get very many people who are going to survive long term in the current gener in my generation, I want to say. Mm. Mm. My generation is that one that you're talking about, that we are we are hustling, which is not longer it, it doesn't have the original meaning. Mm. We are making deals which don't have the original meaning. We are um, doing what we must do so that we can drive the big cars and we can live in the big houses and whatever it is and, uh, you know, show off with the biggest slick winds and so on. Mm. The, the truth of the matter is, and I, and I truly believe this, because I heard my grandfather say it over and over again, and I, I think it's seared into me, that it does not matter how flashy you get because of stolen money, you don't end up with that flashy money. So if you want to make generational wealth, which I'm hearing a lot of Gen Z is talking about, right now they think generational wealth means that we do those things. We steal mm. money, we show off. A mass. A mass as much as possible and make sure that we you know, do this on, on uh, social media so yeah. that people can see just how much money we have. Yeah. Take pictures from all manner of countries so that people can see. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is we saw it in my grandfather's generation, mm. that a lot of the people who today would be in Moi's generation, Moi's age, majority of them... The late president. Uh, the late president. Mm. Majority of them died poor. We are hearing even people who are politicians, who you are told, that guy, ha! Mm. The way he would walk this nini and we would all remove our lessons and put it on the ground for him to, to walk, walk on. on. <laughs> and today, look at him. Those things are now they come full circle. Mm. And I think that what is going to start happening is that there's going to be like a 10%, just 10% of people who are going to make real business work. The only thing that all of us now need to do so that we can create that first 10%, that yeah. first group, yeah. is that we have to go back to where we started. We have to get our people holding the government accountable, especially holding, not government, because government is amorphous. They're not going to hold William to account. Who they will hold to account is this the person who leader. is they have they access to. Mm. That one yeah. they can see. Mm -mm. And that one they can see will then hold the one that they're supposed to be holding accountable because now how do I operate if I how do I say yes to this bill 
um, if it is not going to work for my people. This is the kind of um, push that we need to have. And I'm, I'm very curious to see what people are saying online about these things because mm -hmm. what I'd love to, to hear is if they can tell us stories that they have actually seen so that they support me on this story. Mm -hmm. If they can tell us stories that they have actually seen of people actually coming together and making a specific change happen in their neighborhoods. I bet that there will be so many stories. I'm like sure that. there are very many stories. It's basically bo bottom-up political agenda, transformation agenda, right? Yes. <laughs> this is it. It's not an economic transformation. It's bottom-up political transformation agenda. Right. Starting from the bottom, starting from the local um, village. And as villagers, you all know this is what we want. Who is responsible for this? Is it the local MCA? Is it the ward? Uh, administrator piling pressure on them and moving it upwards very many comments that are coming in on, on uh, our youtube channel Ndu, you can sample a couple mm. i mean it's been going on for a while and it's um so who's responsible for these errors what is the budgetary process mm. who should we actually hold accountable the time has come for citizens to start asking the questions why um um and another thing that has come out quite clearly for a lot of people is that, you know, look, we are living in an almost a very different reality. That The majority of people who live in these situations which we describe are actually um, really going through it. These conversations should be held during elections so that people should have an idea of whom they, they, they should pick. Um, Citizens can speak out. Governments and specific departments can be held accountable. Mm. We can start here if we want to actually change tomorrow. Kenyans will start voting based on issues. Is the day comedians, gamblers, and the wash wash communities will stop contesting for political positions <laughs> in this country. <laughs> People have no connection with tax money. We have connection with what I can see and where I'm operating from. Mm. Um, carrying a motorbike on the head during the rainy season may seem like a story a jabba until we see it. Let me read that one from a series of comments here from Mudoni Tate. I think she's in that community that you're working in. Yes, she is. She says, just recently when I moved to Kilifi, did I realize my ignorance? Now I'm part of the team that wants to get to the bottom of the situation. My team and I at Data Interns are digitizing the budget books from the National Treasury to enable the public to analyze, understand, and access budget data more easily. You'll be surprised to know where your hard-earned money goes, let's not be ignorant anymore. She says, as we talk about debt, we realized huge errors in the recurrent budget book from the sector of external debt redemption. Did you know that there are huge errors in the published budgets? And then she asks, so who's responsible for these errors? What's the budgetary process? Who should be held accountable? If these questions are then asked at that community level, you just break it down, even county budgets. County budget and you come into county development and come from county development into ward development fund. So this is the ward development fund. Uh -huh. This is the amount of money allocated in this year's budget to this particular ward. And these are the projects. Juxtapose it with a CIDP. This is the integrated development plan. You'll get into big things. You know, we you know. thank you very much for joining us today. 9 a.m. Our next guest is Pigeon Odimwengu. He's a community-based mobilizer we'll continue this conversation with him nice 9 a.m time for the news good morning this is news i am dennis aceto Health services might be disrupted today in public hospitals across the country if doctors go through with their threat to down tools. Now doctors through KMPDU called for a national strike to complain, raise their concerns about the attack and injury of the Secretary General Dov Jatela during Friday's protest. Now the doctors said they will hold a peaceful protest in Nairobi and the protest is expected to proceed all the way to Afia House. This as civil servants union says it will join the doctors in the protest. Modeke is the Secretary General. We are the only people in this country who can make this country feel that we are one country. If we fail to do that as workers, we don't have a country. And we are not going to begin on this. We are going to demand for our space as trade union leaders in this country. And that one will not wait. We are doing it on Monday. And I want to call upon all leaders in the public service 
where I represent workers in the civil service and I also stand for workers in the public service. Today I want to call upon them that on Monday they join us when we are going to back health workers in this country to go and demand for their rights at Afia House. Odega claims that the incident where Otella was injured was an attempt on his life. At the same time, he has asked the IG, Jafid Kome, to resign for not taking action against the police officer who was involved in hurting the Secretary General KMPDU. I was expecting uh, an action to be taken on uh, police officers who are responsible for this because that was an assassination attempt on uh, a worker who was not armed and was just trying to demonstrate his right. Today I want to call upon Inspector General of Police to resign because uh, he has refused to instill discipline in the police. He has totally failed to make police responsible in this country. Detectives are holding a 33-year-old man who was found with stab wounds in a room where a 20-year-old woman had been before she fell off to her death in Tome area, Kasarani, the body of John Bula was found on the ground floor of an apartment she had spent the previous night. She was half naked and was only wearing a red t-shirt at the time the body fell off the 10th floor of the White House apartment. It is not clear if she was pushed out of the room, was running away or died by suicide when police arrived at the scene they realized the room she spent in which also served as a short stay accommodation was locked the team contacted the owner of the room who arrived with a spare key now deputy president regard the Kishago said that the government will not tolerate criminals who are troubling the residents of laikipia county speaking in like the county, Gashago said the government's intention is to ensure that citizens live safely. He has warned the security leaders of the county who are negligent at work, insisting that they will be fired. Gashago has also praised the efforts to eradicate illegal alcohol consumption, vowing to continue with the fight. Gashago was accompanied by Defence PS Patrick Mariru, like Kipia Senator John Kinyua, among other Kenya Kwanzaa leaders. These as Mombasa Governor Abdul Somad Sharif Nasir has lashed out at the national government accusing it of failing to deal with the drug menace at the cost. Nasir accused the government of empty rhetoric even as the drug issue continues to threaten the future of many youth in the region. Musikai na mukatulahai hapa kila siku Mutukai mutuambia ya kwa tuawajua Tutawashika, tutafanya nini, tutafanya nini Washikeni Tangu lini, serikali lopita Mutasema ya kwa sio nyinyi mulikweko Sasa ni nyinyi muli, muli, muko katika mamlaka Muna intelligence, muna DCI Muna sijui nini, muna nini, muna nini Na kama hamwezi, mimi hapa ni na kikosi cha maalum Nitawambia hawa members of county assembly tutengeze sheria Tuwe na kikosi cha maalum Cha kuweza kupigana na madawa ya kulevia Mukubali ya kuwa serikali kuu Mumeshindwa na janga hili He said the government was insincere with the anti-drugs war Till when will you continue deceiving the people of Mombasa? Till when will we continue with this downward trend? Ya kukaa kila siku kuhadaa watu. Ati o tutafanya, tutafanya, tutafanya. We are telling you now, fanyeni muashike. Tena muwaparedi mbele ya umma watu wote wa Mombasa. Ya kwa hawa ndio madawa wa kulebe wenye kuafanya, hawa ndio tuloashika. Stop lying to the people. This is News I'm Dennis Asato. Good morning. Ninety four point four Spice FM, Nairobi. It's a really sticky morning in Nairobi, isn't it? So let's look at the streets and what's going on here. Some traffic on the thicker superhighway. That seems to have reduced just a little bit. But hey, look at traffic coming off of uh, Outer Ring. And it's heavy as you then try to approach the thicker superhighway. What else are we looking at? It's still heavy on Kiambu Road as you then approach Mothaiga Square. And it's busy on Limuru Road as well. So we've seen a slight reduction in traffic, but still pretty heavy coming out of Westlands. So the Red Hill Link Road, we saw some traffic there as you're trying to get off of James Kishiro and then head towards Westlands. But that has also reduced. So, okay, if you're heading in that direction, you should be fine, at least for now. 
And then coming off of Ngong Road, uh, also a little bit better here and there. So let's keep an eye on things and see what happens as we come closer to the end of traffic hour. We'll talk on Spice FM, KE on X, hashtag the Situation Room. This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is The Situation Room, the only way to start Seven your day. Nine, we are on to the final law of The Situation Room. And uh, I see a lion are waiting for your email plan at I see a lion dot co dot ke. Also, if you DM them on social media, whether it's TikTok or Instagram or X or Facebook or any other of the social media platforms, I see a lion. That's where you find them. And they say, we've got a plan. Do you have a plan? Whatever plan that you may have, we've got a plan. We've, and our plan is to help you actualize your plan. Our plan is to help you think through whatever plan that you may be having. It could be anything. It could be, I, I, I plan to um, go back to school this year. I plan to uh, move from this job to the next job this year. I plan to uh, get married this year. I plan to get divorced this year. I plan, whatever plan it is that you have, think about it. You will want some support here and there. And I see a lion are experts in helping people work on their plan. So you know, Kubo sana. Sana sana, mm -hmm. Okay. What's the capital of Swatin? It's called Mbambane. Mbambane. Do you have Ecobank in Swatin? We'll have to check, <laughs> but not too far from Swatin. It's Pretoria <laughs> and Johannesburg. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and that's in South Africa. Ecobank okay. is definitely in South Africa. Yes, it is. You're right, and, and just like seventeen, seventeen, th no, uh, more than two thirds of Swatin <laughs> is surrounded by South Africa. Yes, and then there's like a small portion by Mozambique. Mm. Yes. Okay. Which means you will find, even mm. in Mozambique, people who speak that language of Swati. Mm -hmm. But the majority are actually in Swatini mm. and some also in uh, South Africa. In South Africa. Yes, now their population is interesting. Mm. It's just something like around 2.4 million, meaning the population of Nairobi is more than twice mm. Nairobi. So. Mm hmm. But so if you go to, I'm sure, Maputo, you'll find, in, in Mozambique, you'll find Ecobank. In, in South Africa, you'll yes, find you Ecobank. You'll so find one in Windhoek. The people in Namibia. So the people of uh, Swazini can basically just transact. It's a one-hour bus ride, anyway. Uh -huh. I think they can, and they do. Mm. And with internet banking, you can operate your branch, which is in South Africa, from mm. Baban. Yes, you mm. can. Okay. Mm. How does that one do that? Because you're plugged into the Ecobank platform. So that means if at some point you were in Johannesburg or Pretoria, mm. and then you decided that you were going to go over to Windhoek or Blantyre, mm. that means that you don't have to close down your account and start again when you go. It just means that you carry on as you did, so long as you're on mobile banking, internet banking with Ecobank. And they've created a platform which makes it easier for you to carry on with your business transactions as though you never what? Never left. <laughs> as though you never left. Well done. Mm -hmm. So, because of that, it's a better way to do business. And with a better way, we have a better... Life and a better Africa. Well done. Better way, better Africa. A Pan-Africanist joins us for the next conversation. His name is Pigeon Odimwengu. Pigeon is a political party leader. Pigeon was hoping to be elected as president of the republic in 2022. Something happened. What happened? Uh, Chebukati know it. <laughs> so you, you, you did not get qualified for the position. 
Yeah, basically. What didn't you present to Chepkati? Ah, uh, he wanted me to give him identification number of Kenyan citizens of almost 50,000 of them. Ah, right. Not even number, copy of their IDs. To prove that you've got following from all those people. Yeah, mm -hmm. which was uh, which was later on term and constitutional by the court. Mm. Yeah. Okay. But by that time, it was already late. Time. Yeah. A bit too late. Time was gone. So that was her technical knockout. Okay. <laughs> but your your aspirations are still alive. Yeah. Okay. Do you believe you could have gotten the fifty thousand? Yeah. That wasn't hard for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ah yeah. City. Mm. Please give Pigeon the day's proverb. Yes, uh, proverbs. Our proverb for the day mm. from that country which I mentioned, whose capital is Babane. Mm. A man who prides himself on his ancestry is like the potato plant. The best part is underground. Say again. A man who prides himself on his ancestry is like a potato plant. The best is underground. Did you know what's your interpretation of this? Oh. It's good that I have some good relations with the people of Eswatini. Mm -hmm. I think the Secretary General of the there's a caucus of workers in Eswatini. It's like a coalition of workers. Mm -hmm. I met him here. He came over here last year. It's Delamini. Funny thing, the Eswatini community is like one family. Mm -hmm. Delamini family cross over to South Africa <laughs> and even to Eswatini. Mm -hmm. So it's not even beyond like a one ethnic group. It's more of like a one family. Mm -hmm. But even within that same one family, you realize that there are people who oppose the king and they still also casualty that being met. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, the aspect of the underground, that's what I want to focus on. It's like getting back to the roots. And if you pride yourself on your ancestry, which to me will be on your history, mm. then the best you must do is actually go back to the roots. Check the history. Look at the roots. Mm. Then on the roots or at the roots there is when you can be able to know who you are or your future. Because you cannot actually be proud of your history if you don't go back to the roots of your history. And that's what Marcus Gavi say. That a person without a history like a tree without roots. Mm -hmm. So you must actually, and that's a, 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 for future of Africa, we must actually take our keen concentration on our history. Mm -hmm. If you actually have to preserve it, because it is the only strength that can give us what you want for this current uh, current African even in the future. That's what oh, I can say. Very good. The last time you were here, Pigeon, was in 2022. Yes. You were a community leader in um, Mbakasi, yes. right? And you've done a lot in Embakasi in mobilizing the youth in Embakasi. And then you took this nationally, you were mobilizing nationally. Um, of course, you took a stab at wanting to be president. Since then, what have you been doing? Uh, I moved a bit uh, to the continent. Mm -hmm. I've been busy a bit on the continental platforms. One, I'm in, uh, active in the reparations, especially the reparations for the colonial reparations. Because you see, people find reparations to be more of the slave period reparations. But mm -hmm. also the damages that were done in the continent from 84 to 85, 1884 to 1885, the South's reparations, you see. And therefore, I've been in that space actively trying to connect with, the, of course, helping the bigger team of the Kenya here, my more team, try to follow up what efforts they have made so far in terms of even their case in 2013 and reparation mm -hmm. process. But also, we are also pushing beyond reparation, it's about repatriation. Because mm -hmm. uh, most of our brothers who left the continent never left willingly. Some people say that some of our kings sold them, but it is never peaceful. It was a fight. Mm. You either give in after some struggle. So we never sold our brothers who went to the Caribbean. It was a struggle. And they have a right to be back in Africa. So we've been pushing for reparation and repatriation. Apart from that, we've also been pushing so that we get the archives back. Because there are a lot of documents that were stolen from the continent. In fact, within the Commonwealth uh, uh, area, it was close to around 2.5 million files. Mm. And over so many of them were destroyed in Kenya during what you call the Operation Legacy towards the independence so that they could hide the evidence. But now we are getting some of them. So that is where I've been active more. But I've also been a co-chair currently of our philosophical class, which is the Kwame Nkrumah philosophy called the Consciousism. That is the philosophy for decolonizing Africa with the key intention of liberation, unification, and development of Africa. Apart from that, I've been also in the space to try to teach Kiswahili because I'm also a teacher of Kiswahili. I'm a teacher of Christian Swahili. So I've been also giving Swahili lessons freely to the continent to, so that we can be able to attain the unification of Africa in terms of language. So all this what I do, I connect with the Europe, the UK, the US and the Caribbean actively mm. in the continent. That's what I've been doing since then. Are you working under a structured organization? Like, are you a member of a caucus? Are you a member of a group? Are you working for an NGO? 
when you say we have been pushing we have been doing that who's uh, we I'm a member of a Global African Congress which was a global African uh, platform that was formed in Barbados as a, a platform to push for reparation restitution and repatriations of Africans uh, and then I'm also just a member of the Kwame under Kwame Nkrumah Institute of uh, of ideology there's a there's a there's a there's a group of thinkers or philosophers who have been meeting for the last 10 years to study the philosophy of Kwame Nkrumah realize most of books by Kwame Nkrumah were actually banned from many public platforms especially even after the book of neocolonialism so basically uh, i'm not saying that uh, either i work for purely on charitable organizations but mm. those are the space i engage in but i also do a lot of research for purposes of pushing the agenda of unification because you need to support the data how is our military number how is our gdp our population how is our welfare of africa so that when you push the narrative for unification of africa you have data that can convince people that really mm. if you combine this and this it's necessary for us to do this so i've been doing comparative analysis and what the space in china india and the rest of africa and trying to check the potential including the mineral resources exported from Africa. So all these things have been engaging actively to understand the space of Africa and why we need to push for the unity of Africa. Why what would you do with that information when you get it because obviously the quest that you're on now is to gather as much information as you can. Uh what would you do with that information? Because obviously the the thirst the desire to be a leader is still within you uh, yeah. regardless of issues. So as you collect this information what would you do with it? Uh, the basic uh, uh, purpose of this information is to push a narrative and convince people. You see, when you tell Africans that you need to unite, you can ha you have to prove why you need and what's the potential we have. For example, when you are checking the the, the 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 report that was released by an organization called War on Wants mm -hmm. in 2016, they try to show us how many how much companies listed in London Stock Exchange exploit from our mineral resources in Africa, and that was tuning to almost 1.1 trillion. Dollars. Mm -hmm. So if you if you can convince Africans that this is the resources we have as a people, and because we have not pushed for that unification, and because we are not that united, we have exposed the continent too much to exploitation of our resources by the outside the continent. You see, and therefore our unity and preserving our resources can give us this amount. Mm. If you look for the military analysis I've been pushing, you realize that uh, Egypt alone has almost one point something military officers or police officers. And you check like US is having 1.8. So mm -hmm. if you combine the military force of all Africa, it's close to 10 million. Mm. Which means if you can have a united military force, then you don't need any other foreign in, in, in intervention like UN and everything. So we can have unity of Africa. So these are the information you are trying to push. So that when you are pushing narrative, it's not theoretical narrative. It's narrative that can be supported by data, and data can convince you that if really this is what you have, is possible for us to attain a continent. That's why I've been deeply in this research and getting these statistics. Mm. I'm actually yes. happy to hear what you're saying. It's a good thing. Because it, um, this, anything that has to do with uniting Africans, because our relatives and colleagues in the Caribbean and in the Americas, th those are our people. They're actually Africans. Call them African-American, call them Afro-Americans. They, yes. they, they are still Africans. But how exactly does Africa achieve the unification you're speaking of when, when we look at our own countries, we are completely fragmented as countries. I mean, you find a unit called a country. And even that country, maintaining the whole, maintaining the centerpiece so that if everybody coalesces together is a problem on this continent. And it, that is a, that, what I'm saying is attested to by the attempted coups, successful coups, and more so the glaring atrocities that we see during election times so if this is the representation of what happens within our countries, I'm not saying you shouldn't aspire for unification. We should. But then how then do we get there? Do we continue aspiring for the unification of Africa or do we focus on trying to see if we can unify our countries first? Okay. Uh, uh, Nkrumah says that, of course, the unity of our territory is very fundamental because mm. that is the basic. But you must also realize that uh, we are struggling to unite countries who are separated by lines that actually not take into consideration the communities. These Berlin lines actually separated nations. We call them nations, not even ethnic groups or tribes. Africa was made up of nations. And these nations were separated. Mm -hmm. So some nations you find they overlap in the other side. The others are in this other side, you see? So you have even in the border of Kenya and Uganda, there's other nations in the other side. In Somalia, border, there's other nations in the other side. But the, 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 the struggle internally of tribes, the so-called tribes now, is actually politically motivated. 
And this has been used the same way. Of course, Nkrumah said that the Balkanization of Africa is not for the interests of Africa. It was the tactic we call divide and rule. Divide them so that it can be very easy to penetrate. You see, mm -hmm. like now, if you have to push for any agenda like now, what we are pushing for this unification of Africa in this position, you see, we still have to rely on these territories, these small countries, mm -hmm. the so-called countries, so that they bring a collective uh, uh, voice so that they can support this. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy for you to stop that because you are divided. Uh, any Western country interested in anything else can come in and jeopardize this process. Mm -hmm. So locally or internally, I'll tell you that uh, the the same tactics is being used. The division of tribes is being used by the the, the political class for their political interest. I'll tell you after the election, like now, there is no any animosity between the tribes. Anybody who is in Kisum, whether you are uh, you are a Kikuy or you are Kalenjin, you'll do your business. You see, mm. but until that time, when a politician tap to it, is a card that is being used for success, and maybe this this aspect, I think, is lack of ideology in our politics. Then then our politics have to be backed by tribes, and and and, and uh, calling your your community, mm. which you must also realize to the people that none of the tribes have ever benefited actually out of the so-called tribal elections, because today. It's still the same challenge in terms of cost of living. It's all over. Mm. Mm. But the so-called big, the elites, the political class, will unite for their benefit. They will be appointed. But today, there's no community that can say today that they are benefited out of their tribal election or their tribal voting in the last election. So I'll say that tribe or uniting a country is fundamental. But the people we have here are not actually uniting a country because of their interests. Because they know a united country may not give a space for any other policy that is not actually to the people. So that is the challenge we have. And that's why Nkrumah said that if we don't unite by that time, mm -hmm. we might perish. Mm. And this is what has been going on. Our division has actually costed us a lot. Mm. Yes. What do you think would bring people together? Most times we see people unify mm. or unite rather because they're common issues. Mm. The likelihood of you uniting with somebody else mm. is low if there's nothing that you have in common. Mm. So what would you think would bring people together for the better good? We're talking about a development agenda that's, you know, much lower than it should be, you know, mm. really fighting or punching below its potential. Mm. And there's so many things that are just not going. I mean, the last two hours we had a conversation about why is it not possible to get things running? How do we go past personal desire to make sure that the development agenda, unification agenda is actually achieved? You see, as I've said that, uh, we must first of all aspire, first of all, the United Nations of Africa, mm -hmm. the unity of nations, before we go to the United States, the so-called states or countries of Africa. Mm -hmm. Can you, sorry, I'm going to stop you there, just mm -hmm. a minute. Mm -hmm. the, 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 it, the, the units that are going to come for an overall unification mm. have issues can you bring unhealthy underdeveloped poorly governed units to come and unite if they still have issues now that's why i, I talked of the nations mm. for example what is the issue between the nilotic community of this country and the bantus was the conflicting issue here mm. But there might be conflicting issues between, for example, Rwanda and Congo, or Kenya and Uganda. And that will extend to the border, resources, and everything else. Mm. But if you have to talk today, what is the conflicting issue between the people of Central mm. and people of Nyanza, in terms of the people, the community? Mm. There's no conflicting issue, you see? If you talk of the Nilos, whether they are, they are not conflicting. But the countries, the territories where there's conflicting issues, that's all I'll tell you, for example, when you divided a country like, uh, or put a border between the Congo and Rwanda, you know the key issue is what? The resources are too much in the other side than this other side. And therefore, we have to cross over for the resources, you see? And this other side feels that this is our resources because there was a border that was put here is our resources in Congo, you see? And when the community cross over, because of that boundary, the conflict come in, you see? We are protecting our land. Mm. But if you have to remove the so-called artificial boundaries, or in fact, they are artificial. If you have to get them out and think of the whole people as they are, it's not very hard. So I'll say the difficulty uniting Africa is if you think in terms of states. Because today, the, the Somalis still claim there's some part that still belongs to them as a country based on the territory. Mm -hmm. But the Somali people in Somalia and the Somali people in Kenya, or even the Somali people in Somalia and the Kikuyu people in Kenya, what's their conflicting problem? Were there no boundary disputes even before the Berlin Conference? 
between the communities you see the, the, did the maasai and the kamba not fight over boundary or the maasai and the kipsigis or the maasai and the kisi or the maasai and the kikuyu did they not fight over boundary the, the, the issue the or the kipsigis and the luo did the they issue, not fight the issue was the land not boundaries uh-huh. you see and there was this process of expansion because you realize from our migration point when you talk of the area there bargazel or the origin the old central africa mm-hmm. realize when the arabs invaded africa it was actually push so everybody was trying to push as you move down you get a space you push the next person you see it was actually occupation but it was not based on too much of the the boundary issues it was just for settlement you see mm-hmm. and when you realize like when they were practicing now the modern castro wrestling is appearing to be more illegal mm-hmm. but by then it was a practice like a tradition it was not too much of the the war and the conflict you see mm-hmm. so what i can say is that traditionally we had kingdoms that were trying to expand you see mm-hmm. of course there were you know conflict in between expansion of kingdoms and whatever and everything else but it was not to this scale whereby now it's about a line mm-hmm. a line that was drawn by somebody and imposed there you see so africans of course challenges might not totally disappear in terms of differences even in a the house there's mm-hmm. still personal differences between the families and you still have to survive but it's easier to manage it if you see yourself as a people than trying to line or trying to fight over an artificial boundary somewhere that's the biggest problem that's coming in you see mm-hmm. and this artificial boundary then has, has has actually hacked as a loophole you see for example i'll give you a clear example when africa is now moving to an extent of uniting in african free continental trade agreement we are trying to open the market for all africans to trade mm-hmm. but you see what now happens one country in the west who do not have access to the whole continental agreement will have to come to a specific country like for example maybe kenya mm-hmm. send an agreement that you are going to trade with kenya maybe from the west like us and, and european then they set their company here once they set their company here what does it mean they have access to they have access to the whole of africa yes. so you see those small weaknesses we have as different countries causing us this and i will tell you for example you talked about a swatini which is close to 2 million mm. there are the countries here that are close to almost a million while well, a province in in india is having 200 million people mm. so you wonder what's the need of all those so called countries Well, it's not viable at all because mm. tell me for example let's continue with the 2 million going to sit with China for our business deal mm. that you are going to have a win win there how will the win win come out you have a lot of resources no potential to exploit it yeah. but as i said have the whole potential they're looking for resources and these are courses allowed for a period of time and that's what i'm saying it's going to be very hard if you still have to continue in this direction mm. it's very hard for us let's take a break we we'll continue this conversation shortly Pigeon, you also tell us I've seen you've written a letter to President William yeah. Ruto. The letter is here. Eh? Ah, you're to tell somebody about it shortly. Pigeon Odimwengu is a Pan-Africanist. He, what's the name of the political party again? Sorry. Accountability and Transparency Party. Accountability and Transparency Party. He's the party leader. He wanted to be the president in the last election. He's a young man. He's been a community mobilizer in Nairobi starting from his local community in Mbakasi taking it to the county and to the country and now he's moving this whole conversation into the entire continent of Africa 29 minutes past 9 time for this break we'll be back shortly good morning this is the situation room the only way to start your day i've got a plan to make my investment season hotter <laughs> than a sunday barbecue grill ICEA Lion has a plan for everyone. Talk to us today for a plan that's right for you. Or visit icealion.co.ke. ICEA Lion. What's your plan? All right, so we're getting to the hour where traffic hour comes to an end, but still pretty busy in the city this morning. Not letting up on Landis, neither is it letting up on Highly Selassie. It's been that way since 5:30 this morning. Heavy traffic still continues in parts of the Thika Super Highway, but we're seeing that Kiambu Road traffic a thing of the past. Also on Limuru Road, that's reducing, but uh, Wangari Mathai is heavy as you get out towards Chiromo and then through towards the city. Muranga Road also very heavy. And um taking a look at Uhuru Highway then now trying to get towards Haile Selassie and then into the city center so it's busy all over the place so we're just keeping an eye on things and see what happens as we get through the morning traffic hour says it's over but still some sticky spots so watch out for those and then let us know through the morning what it looks like and indeed through the day spies fm ke on x Spice FM Nieri
mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice FM. Please give me the letter. Read. Okay, mm. so you've written to the president, yes, and you talked about candidature for the African Union Commission chairperson, right? You wrote to him on the 1st of March, which was Friday. I hope this letter finds you in good health. I'm writing to express my sincere interest in the position of African Union Commission chairperson, which will be open in 2025. You said you firmly believe that the African Union has a critical role to play in unifying the continent, both politically and economically. You go on to talk about um, the core values of the AU, fostering unity, promoting economic prosperity, and securing peace across Africa. However, you say, I, chair, I share your concerns that progress towards these goals has been sluggish. The dream of United Nations of Africa remains elusive, and the timeline set for 2063 seems unrealistic. We cannot afford to take another 120 years to unite our continent. Ghana, a staunch proponent of African unity, was even willing to forego its independence for the greater cause of unification. I propose that with strong political will, we can achieve this monumental task within a maximum of 10 years. I equally propose a collective and inclusive approach to achieving it, this within a realistic time frame building upon the legacy of visionary pan-African leaders like Kwame Nkrumah, who championed continental unity. For example, in his speech when he talked about our objective is African Union now. There is no time to waste. We must unite or perish. Of course, going on to talk about the balkanization of Africa. Mm. You say you acknowledge the qualifications outlined for the AU Commission chairperson. I must express my reservations regarding the requirement of a master's and PhD education. It is my belief that the unification agenda should not be limited to the top elites in our continent, which endanger the union to elitism or reduce its elites to competition. It should embrace diverse paths to excellence. Many of our heads of state, despite their invaluable contributions, do not hold advanced degrees. Africa's literacy levels are evolving and must ensure that leadership positions are accessible to those who possess the necessary skills, experience and commitment. I'm going to jump. I present myself as a progressive Pan-African, committed to building a stronger, unified Africa. This letter serves as an initial step in engaging with the broader Pan-African community, the AU, the AU Youth Council, Pan-African institutions, regional economic blocs, and media outlets. You say the application is not just about myself, but about amplifying the voices of all Africans, especially the progressive Pan-Africans, youth and marginalized communities, beliefs in building a collective power through collaboration. So, Your Excellency, I kindly request that the State House of Kenya consider my candidature without discrimination. I seek your support and that of our great nation as I embark on this journey to serve our continent. My commitment to the ideals of Pan-Africanism, the spirits of our founding Pan-Africans, and my unraving dedication to the AU's vision and mission drive me forward. Mm -hmm. And you're looking forward to the opportunity to discuss the vision further yes. with him. So you want to be AU Commission Chairperson? Yes. So you can drive this agenda. Yes. And you say, well, some of these qualifications that have been put there for this position are completely discriminatory and they therefore just creating this position be an, an elitist position. Yes. Even the people who will be voting for the person who becomes AU commission chairperson do not meet these qualifications. Yes. On education alone. Yes. Not many presidents in Africa have a PhD yes. or a master's degree. And yet they'll be voting for somebody and they say that that person must have a PhD or a, a master's degree, mm. PhD added advantage and all those things. All right. So why, why do you think that this is the best route for you to achieve this agenda? You see, uh, there has been actually, <coughs> I'll say more of disappointment to some of Africans mm. who feel that the AU has actually not met its goal. <coughs> and some have even discussing whether we should have an alternative AU or is it time now to change AU as it was changed from OAU to something else. Mm. But I still believe that it has existing structures that if it gets now the progressive people inside, then we can be able to push it. Because it's, it's a matter of, I, and when I give a time frame like 10 years, it's, it's, it's actually political goodwill. The president, the other time, just said that we will remove visa. Mm. It never took 63 years to remove visa. <laughs> and if it was to be actually realistic enough, we could not have any visa anywhere. Mm. So some of these actually problems you're having, just pronouncement. 
So you can't see how the pronouncement will take uh, over 50 years just to make an, a pronouncement. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel that we, with the setup of AU, if we can just change and get, you know, in, in Pan-African space, you have three Pan-Africans. We have the liberal, conservatives, and progressive Pan-Africans. The, 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 the progressive Pan-Africans actually look beyond, not, the, the, not their class. And if you can have progressive Pan-Africans inside this, we can drive it to where it's supposed to be. Of course, I actually uh, still share my feeling that all those have checked the history of those who have been chairpersons of AU at the end of the day since, since 2002. Most of them, of course, have that degree and master's. But that has still not made us achieve this. In fact, in their degrees and their master's, they still envision that we can achieve it in 50 years, which is actually unrealistic to me. So mm. I really feel that there's a, there needs to be a space so that we talk about the Africa within that setup. Because it was founded from a OAU. Mm. And you see, by then in 1963, they were so convinced that we could attain unity now. It was an organization of mm -hmm. African it unity. Was even unity, yes. which was now changed to a union. Yeah. You see? And actually, they, 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 they justified that they changed it to a union to now focus on economics and social aspect. Mm. But they forgot about the liberation of Africa. And that's why even today, they either call it Africa Day instead of Africa Liberation Day. Mm. The liberation is still going on. You know, one of the things that I've always found interesting mm. when I'm looking at the topic and subject of unification, I look at countries that achieve data. Eh? If we're talking about the 19th century, two countries, very huge countries in Europe, were exactly what we are here. Italy, Germany. Little provinces, everybody doing their own thing, kings and princes and all over the place. Mm. Now, I look at Italy, with a gentleman called Garibaldi, a revolutionary gem, uh, <laughs> a general, was among the people who was key in bringing Italy together until it became a kingdom. Okay? And that happened in 1871. Then you look at Germany. There was a Prussian prince, a duke actually, a lot of von Bismarck, did the same thing with Germany. Knocked people's heads together. They came together. Now, if I look at the time when they began their quests, when those countries were unified, and then I look at what then became the EU, Okay, For Germany, it was 122 years from that point to the time the EU was formed, mm -hmm. bringing the Europe. For Italy, it was 132 years, meaning a century had to go by. All these attempts at let's unify, let's do this, let's do this, until eventually. But I mention this because those countries were then that were unifying as under the EU flag were already unified. They are things they had agreed on. Now, if you look at our own timetable, we must start somewhere, and what you're doing is a good start. What are the steps that we must follow to show that we're actually getting there? I see us struggling with the East African community. It's a good step. But from where you sit, you're the one who's done the research, you've done the thinking. Mm -hmm. What are these things that we need to see to understand that the unification is getting closer and closer, even if it's just baby steps? Uh, you see, you, uh, thank you for those good citations or for, for those examples. But you also check out the Americans. When they struggled to have the United States of America, it was never United States. No. It was the Civil War that even actually resulted to the unity. Yep. In fact, they struggled, they fought for their unity. They did among themselves. Yeah. First of all, they fought the British. Yes. Then they fought the French. Then they fought for the Yes, Mas among them. Massacred the native uh, uh, communities, I mean, the Native Americans. And then proceed to fight among themselves. Now, if you also go to an example of a colonized territory that was colonized like India, even after colonization, they still retain their India. Look at the unity of China. Mm. You see? And you see, when you measure our population, we can only measure our population against something like India or China. We cannot measure our population in line with the U.S., which is around 350 million, you see? Mm? Mm. So, uh, re uh, re realistically, is that since there were two school of thoughts, the Casablanca one and the Monrovia one, during the 1963. There's a school of thought that insisted that we start by unity now. But there's a school of thought that insisted that let's first of all go to countries. Then we now come to regions, then we'll be back to where we are supposed to be. And this was led, of course, with the part of Julius Nyerere, which actually he admits later over 10 years that it took him over 10 years to actually understand what Nkrumah meant by us going the one direction. If you check now over the 60 years that we went to countries and even where we are today, you realize that even that so-called unity has not attained actual unity in terms of our peace and stability. Because mm. the key issue for you to unite is your welfare. Mm -hmm. You are uniting to improve your welfare, to improve your peace, and your economic 
well-being. You don't just unite for the purpose you're uniting and there's nothing you're eating. So unity is actually to preserve your development. Now look at the East African community that has united. How has it advanced the development of East Africa community? You see? Now Somalia is coming in and uh, DR Congo are here. And you realize that you're still fighting for the same, same resources in one side. There's a country interested to get the resources on the other side through some people, you see? And even in this aspect, we have not actually totally liberated us ourselves. Because even in Kenya, as we are moving to to East African community. We are, open, uh, we are opening up for Europe, for US with the treaty deals. We are giving our resources like the Talo oil to, for the other countries, you see. Unity was actually to use whatever you have within your territory, which is below our land. Because the struggle for Africa is what is below our land and above our land. Mm -hmm. But we have not even used it in our unity. So I don't think that the so-called regional blockings will actually lead us to all African unity for sometimes. You see, uh, the, the legs of African Traore are even now walking out of that regional outfit. They are saying we are out of ECOWAS. Mm. So they are clearly meaning that this ECOWAS and this regional block are not even meant to, to lead us towards the total unity of Africa. They're actually just meant to be the cocoons to monitor you and still being used by the West. <laughs> so that is the biggest problem. So I, I, I think that we should not still entertain that the regional block will lead us to unity. We should just assume and, not assume even, accept that you have to go straight direction. Let's unite. Into one united Africa. Africa. Straight to it. Why is it important that we have a united Africa? Now, the reason why it will be important is that when you have one united Africa, one you will do away with these wars of the, the, the so-called countries fighting, the, the, the Berlin Wall wars, the Amazonia and the Cameroon thing, the, 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 the Congo thing, you see? Mm -hmm. When one country wants to cross over because of a border. Two, you'll open up Africa for free movement, as we say, free movement of everything else, you see, both goods and people, you see. Three, you can actually decide from the continental level that now the resources of Africa will not continue to be exploited as being exploited through either, let me go talk with the President Ruto, I'll get access to their land, I'll use their oil. You have now to go through a unified common front. And the last thing is that it gives us more bargaining power even as we interact with the rest of the world, you see. When you want to go maybe for EU deal, is Africa with its population going to discuss with EU, you see. Is Africa, is population going to discuss with China? Not all African head of state seated in China to discuss with one country, China, vis-a-vis -vis 55 presidents, you mm -hmm. see? Not all Africa are going to maybe U.S. to sit down to discuss with one country. So we actually will get a better advantage in terms of even negotiation with the external, uh, external world, the continents, in terms of the numbers, the power we have in our numbers. And then we'll have security of our resources. Is it feasible? Mm -hmm. Is it feasible to actually have a united Africa, united in all those things that you've talked about? Apart from the fact that we are black mm -hmm. And we have these high levels of melanin. And then we have the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Mediterranean, which puts our laws in, in, in one piece of land. What else is common about? You see... What is this that would make us feel we are truly united? We are one. Are we? few things. Let's start, first of all, by even if you have to have one passport or one ID of all Africa as a unification. Like now, we are all Kenyans with one ID. You call yourself a Kenya because you have one ID. Mm. You can have one African ID instead of these small IDs. Mm. You, you, you are one. If you can speak one African language. Because you know, even you don't have any way how we can hide our secrets from them. Because I have to speak their English. So there's no way I can hide any of my secrets from them, mm. you see. But if you can all Africa, you move to Tanzania, you move to Ghana, you can speak Swahili and you, you are together. Yoruba, all over the Africa, and you're together. Mm. If you can have one same currency, now you have to move there, change it to another thing else. And even change it to dollars, which is not even African thing. Backed by our gold, which they don't have there. They have it from here. So you see, all those are the physical characteristics of our unity. Because now, it's very clear. Mm -hmm. The land that you move all over, you move from here, is another plus whatever, is plus whatever. The currency you move from plus whatever, the ID is plus. It's, it's totally different things. So if you can first of all start by those physical things, before even we move to what they call the total political unity. If you can just abolish all these small things and have one united things, like one document for passport, one document for ID, one language all over the, uh, Africa, then that is the progress towards unity. Not one regional block for us, another regional block. It doesn't lead us to anywhere. I can see the ideal. Mm. And, you know, the ideal on paper sounds yes. very good. It's doable. Yes. But do you see the people of Africa actually getting there? I don't see the elites of Africa getting there. Not, Not the people the elites, of Africa. The people of Africa, the you and I, the you. You see. Uh, Pidgin Odimwengu and, and some Pidgin guy who's in West Africa. I really aspire to go to Ghana mm -hmm. and have their passport or have one African passport in Ghana, speak Swahili with them. And I don't think that being more of paper thing. It's something that I, I, I think is possible. If today we are to start a program, for example, in language, and teach the whole African in the next 10 years Swahili, or even if it's Yoruba, we'll all be speaking one language. 
You see, even if you start by the, this younger generation, in the next 20 years, they'll be united. It's not actually not possible. It's something possible. They brought their English, then actually we took away our traditional language, then carried their language, and it became possible for them. You see, we united from our small kingdoms or whatever called kingdoms and clan to a country. It was still possible for us, you see. So I don't think that the unification of Africa is still elusive, as I'm saying the 2063 is actually elusive to me, you see. I don't think that our unity is still elusive. It's possible if we have the political goodwill and if you have the commitment. The only thing that makes it that way is because the majority of people we have, especially those whom we live to decide this position and these decisions as top leaders, are still not actually looking inward to the African potential, but they aspire even to the, be in the West. That's why they want to go stay in the West. They have a house somewhere. They want to take their kids somewhere. So they are here tentatively by body, but the spirit is out. You know, the <laughs> I, I always hear people talk about speaking this foreign language which we are speaking now as though it's a negative thing. Is it really necessarily a negative thing? In the same way that it is used as a tool for colonization, but are there not advantages we have in being able to speak and understand this language as well? No, it has played an advantage. It has been able actually now we, to unite us. Have, have we exploited, thank you, have we exploited the advantages that this language affords us as much as we can? Because remember, this is a language that is probably the most spoken on the planet. It's this true. one. It's true. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is, if you focus on what already unites us, and what we already have, and how we can build on it as we look at the other ways of building in on this. See, there's an advantage African countries have if you were colonized in this. Very many of your citizens will speak more than one language. Yes. Whether they like it or not, they will speak more than one language. Yes. In Kenya, you'll probably speak three. And it's normal. Now, in the West, most of them you speak one language. One, not even two. When you speak two languages, it's considered a big thing. Now, do you know what that does to your mind? Just the dexterity of moving words and languages in your brain. It actually makes your brain that much better, that much more versatile, that much stronger. So we have many advantages that we lose when we whine and complain about the problems we've had from colonization. As we whine and complain about it, we're entrenching it. Instead of saying, okay, it happened, okay, we've got that one. Now, can we now focus and talk about the very things that you're talking about? But then, see, if you look at me carefully, you will see I'm not young. <laughs> carefully. Yes. How many people of your generation who, when I look at you, are clearly young, believe what you're saying? And support it? No, th th that's, that's, that's actually the biggest, that's the biggest space we have here that you must feel. That the old conversations of actually the younger generations have not actually been brought up to this speed. You see, the older generation having experience that maybe it failed, were not willing enough to pass it to the younger generation based on the experience of his failure. Mm. You see, and at that time, that's why I'm saying the younger generation, even when I present my, 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 my position on this, is a wake-up call to the younger generation to start thinking of how do we move beyond the, the small uh, party within your community to think of how do we take over Africa or how do we unite Africa as younger generation, you see? Because it's even when the, 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 this struggle for climate became more successful, it moved to even a younger generation, you see? Mm. Some, somebody is a climate champion in nursery or in class one, you see? And these are even the reparation struggle. Many young Africans don't even know what is reparation or why you should we have it, you see? But the people who have the information have not passed it. So I, I, I come in this space actually to also make it like a wake-up call for the younger people. We need to think beyond this. Because the younger people have the potential. You see, this technology and the advancement they brought to us is actually a, a tool we must use to unite ourselves, you see? If I have to teach now Swahili, I'm teaching it from English to Swahili, you see? So I still have the advantage of using their language to teach our fellow Africans who don't understand my Swahili so that they can get the Swahili we unite for the Africa, you see? So we still have to use this. Look at the, 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 the potential you have in technology. We can unite all over the African, you see? But our younger people are still not in the space of using technology for the purpose of unity. It's technology for show marks, technology for whatever else, technology for something else, you see, without looking inward. Of course, there are so many people who are trying to not bring Afrocentric spacing or Afrocentric thinking in regards even of technology and education and everything else. So the gap is here within the younger generation. And there must be actually serious effort to reach out to these people, you see? Serious effort to reach out to these people. Well, that's what you call the... the, the, the ma uh, uh, Sakara call it uh, political orientation or the mass awakening. Mm. They need to go to the masses. As, of course, still Nkrumah said that the revolution must be won by the masses. Until it goes to the masses, it doesn't have any future, you see. 
So it's the struggle to push it to the masses. But it has remained in the corridors of some boardrooms being discussed somewhere. And that's why the majority of Africans even don't think that it's something that's out there to make any sense to them. And that's the space you're coming in. I want to go back to the stuff of unification. And I think it is extremely important. We can talk about the need for unification, but I think we need to look at what's happening within those units. In as much the Balkan, as much as the balkanization of Africa happened, whereby people who had come from living together in the same space as communities then were separated. Yes. We understand that. Yes. However, as a result of that, we saw that these places or these areas which eventually became nation states then had leaders. And the, the aspiration was to get to a place where development occurred, the livelihoods of people were protected and then sustained over time. Unfortunately, the story for many African nations today is that the development index has remained premature. It has not gone anywhere. In some, it has progressed to a certain extent in others. Can you have a unified continent? Because we're talking about unification of people. We're talking about easy access of trade. We're talking about the opening of borders. We're talking about the livelihoods of people. Can you have one healthy unified continent if the units are not healthy? Thank you. Uh, really, as I'd said before, the reason for unity is still for the welfare of the units. You see? But the, what has made the units not healthy? The leaders are actually from the same units. Mm -hmm. They are not foreigners. Of course, they know our white men who are now controlling Africa like presidents. But they use the blacks to control Africa in another way possible. You see? It is very hard. And that's why I say the fundamentals for the unity of Africa still also lies with the people. Mm. These units. But if you check, there's a possibility of units or so-called communities to develop. Mm -hmm. This possibility is something that what's like is that, I still call it political win. This possibility, look at, for example, how much you spend to either MCAs or let me say, for example, the so-called CDF or members of parliament mm. for the last maybe 10 years. How much is it? For only that constituency, if that money was actually targeting to help the people there and being used for the people. For the last 10 years, you've been giving a member of parliament around 100 million. Could that not actually advance their welfare? So we cannot actually sometimes say that it, it is very difficult to develop the people. It's the mindset of the leaders who are there. They are not actually using the resources for the benefit of those people. Look, for example, the budgeting we've been doing since 1963. If you can't do it in terms of trillions, and you still wonder we still don't have roads somewhere, you wonder, do you want to say that it is now impossible that even those trillions could not lead to any development? <laughs> so we cannot move further to that direction. The reality is that we have the potential. It's just the will that is missing. The will that is missing. Today is 3 trillion or 4 trillion. Count it for 10 years. <clears throat> and you still have people who don't have any shelter anywhere. Or don't have any road anywhere. Or any food anywhere. So how much do we need? But we still have people in the same same community who have become billionaires. With the same same money. Who drive and live like... In fact, the Africans who are richer than the West. Very richer than the West. So they got the resources where? Here. They got their money where? Here. They used the money, the resources that were here. The West, as I've told you, actually contributed or listed 1.1 trillion dollars from Africa. So you cannot say that we don't have the resources. I'm saying it's the political will. And that's what I'm saying. is the will of the leaders actually to look at the people and say, let me do this for the people. We have the possibility and the potential to do that. Look at even our counties. How much have we been spending to county budgets for the last 10 years? And you want to tell me still counties are still asking for revenue or still asking for more support. 10 years of helping the counties could be enough for them to be independent. But today, <laughs> they still don't have it. So I'm saying we have the potential to develop or even to unite, the only thing that is missing is the will. And you wonder why these people are not willing. And the reason is because it's not sometimes to their benefit. Because if you tell maybe, for the example, the rich person, that let's make everybody rich in this village, they'll be like, hey, if everybody's in our way, will I get more wealth? Somebody told me people are rich because some people are poor. And that's how they, they became rich. <laughs> <laughs> so it's that will that's lacking, the progressiveness of thinking beyond yourself to the people. The liberals and the conservatives are too much of ourselves. That's the problem. How many progressives are there in Africa? I, do you think you have sufficient numbers, like a critical mass that can move this conversation forward? Yeah, we have so many people speaking. We have so many people who think and don't have the ability or the platform to speak of this. 
They are there. Mm -hmm. The only thing that is missing is them to be given the platform to start speaking this direction. There are people meet. Like I'm telling you, my class of philosophy has been meeting for the last 10 years. In fact, I joined them like three years ago and I realized these old men have been meeting, uh, they're Africans sometimes in the UK, they've been meeting in some hall for the last 10 years discussing the philosophy. And I wonder why do they read one book forever? <laughs> and it's just because they want to build their thinking and their understanding in terms of whether the ideal is in position or the material is in position in Africa. And you realize that the problem with Africa is that we were either born idealist or either believe in too much of idealism, spirits and ideas. That's why we could pray there for the rain and the corruption to disappear so that we, the next day we will see the country now is now governed. We call for prayers for things that are actually not caused by prayers. Yeah? So we are too much in that side without thinking of our material welfare, our material well being. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that when Africans have to be materialists in terms of ideology mm -hmm. and think of their material possession, material in terms of matter, what is be below our resources, we can get everything else. You see, uh, happiness, everything else, either fulfillment come from the same thing I call land and mm -hmm. the resources we have. But we are out there, I'm not against people praying, we are out there, including a leader who still, or a leader who loot from you, still pray that God change everything else so that you can have your resources. And the next day, you take the same, same resources that God could have used to help you. So that thinking and that philosophy is what has been lacking. The African's unification lacks common ideology and common philosophy. If, if, even if it's not you, if a progressive became the chairman of the African Union Commission, let's say it's Pitgin Odimwengu or somebody else, do you think that one per person would be able to move this conversation? Yeah, it was... What do they need? They need that in-depth awareness, consciousness. As a Sit person? Yes. You start from a person. Sit down. Like now we have a conversation here. So let's say the one person with that awareness, yes. like one of your uh, group, yes. actually ascends to that position of AU Commission Chairperson. Then? I'll give you, the, uh, the, I'll give you a good analogy of that. Mm. They say the gospel started with Jesus or the rest. Some mm. of us never saw him. Mm. We're never with him. But today we defend him. It started with the one person mm. who has the right will and the mind to sit down with those who are there. Everybody can be converted. Some either convert from their tradition to Christianity or to Islam. But if you have a person who can drive the conversation, it's a matter of sharing thinking that can then build the consciousness and say, Nyewe, this is the direction you need to go. But if that person who can start that conversation is lacking there, mm. then everybody there enjoy their normal traditional chit chats. I, I think it's not possible. So we need one person to be in that space who have this thinking. Then start sharing those guys. Because I believe through sharing common direction and building consciousness, we can move to a direction. We defend this. And I'll tell you, the gospel and everything else that was started, started with one missionary. There were not 10 missionaries who came to Africa. It was one missionary who started something somewhere. But today we are all missionaries. By default. Yeah, that's by default. We are all missionaries and evangelists or, or the defenders of Christ, you see. Mm. So it's still possible. The missing point is who is that person and does he have access to be in that place okay. where he can start the conversation. This letter by Pedgin Nuribuengu that you wrote on the 1st of March. Yes. Where is it now? Has it gone it's to... Been, it's been has received it, to status. Has it been delivered? Yes, the it was delivered the and confirmed received. So I'm, 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 it has been stamped received. No, they told me they mark it received. By when? At the office. No, they marked it received. Uh -huh. I, I went with two copies. This is the original copy that was marked received and the rest remained with the president. Mm. And uh, so I'm hoping whether you will want to put it by Petiake or you will call me so that you can have a conversation. Is, uh, is, 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 but I think the candidate also is not President Ruto's candidate. Mm -mm. No, it's not. It's, it's not even, it's not a President Ruto's candidate. So I think he should exercise what is due to or what is needed for of him to call me and let's have a conversation and see how he can also take me to, to, to check for those cartels the other side they went so that I can be able to start my own campaign and see if I can reach out to the people because I need to reach out to the voters. Okay. And the voters are the other president. <laughs> yes. So I need to have that platform. <laughs> okay. Pitgin, all the best. Pitgin Adimwengu is a Pan-Africanist. He is a progressive Pan-Africanist. He's been our guest this morning. Thank you very much for tuning in to Kenya's Biggest Conversation. Always a pleasure. See you here tomorrow. God willing, it's 10 a.m. Thank you. Spice up your life.
Good morning, this is Newswire. Dennis Asato. Defense Cabinet Secretary Eden Dual is expected to kick off a three day official visit to the Arab Republic of Egypt. Dual will be hosted by his Egyptian counterpart, General Mohammed Ahmed Zaki. The visit is aimed at reinforcing the strategic partnership between Kenya and Egypt. Delegations from Nairobi and Cairo are expected to discuss a range of topics including regional security implementation of cooperation agreements on maritime and aerial security and opportunities for professional military academic institutions. The defense cooperation between the two countries is a testament to their deeply rooted relationship. Kakamega County may be the first in the country to approve a bill to deal with cases of sexual violence into law as soon as the county governor Fernandez Baraza signs it. Kakamega Health CEC Bernard de Songa has said that the law will help reduce gender-based violence while praising the Kakamega gov government's efforts to ensure that the issue of gender-based violence is addressed. Hii mswada imeshia petishwa na uh, National Assembly. Uh, sasa inangoja public participation, alafu ipetishwe na governor. Vilo umesema uh, hii kaundi yetu wa Kamega hiko na visa visa uh, uh, via SGBV uh, na pia visa via miemba ya mapema kwa sikiana wetu na pia uh, maamukisi ya ukimu. Uh, hii mswada ikisha petishwa uh, tunawuhakika kwamba itarudisha chini ama itapunguza uh, hizi miemba ya mapema na pia uh, kwa mkisa kwa ukimu na pia hiyo uh, utulimio kwa, kwa, kwa jinzia uh, kwa sababu tuko na uh, pengele hapa ndani yenye mtu atapohusishwa na hii kudhulumu kwa jinzia atachukuliwa hatua kali na uh, sheria ya hii mswada Rose Mohanda, who is involved in health issues in Kakamega County, praised the efforts of the stakeholders in the health sector and the office of the spouse of Kakamega Governor Janet Kasili Baraza have met in dealing with cases of gender-based violence, where Kakamega County is now ranked fifth throughout the country. Uh, Kakamega County tumekuwa kati ya zile counties ambazo tuna report uh, numbers nyingi lakini tukiangalia leo tumeanza kuunguza ile idadi kama wale wasichana wanapata mimba wakiwa miaka kumi kufika 14 tumepunguza kabisa kutoka top 10 initially 